please. And ultimately, we need a vaccine for TB. So because of that, I guess the, the team that we have for our annual TB research day, for World TB Day, is vaccination for TB. And where are we? So with, with that, I, I'd like to uh, welcome. Center, which, as we know, is a PHO and World Health Organization collaborating center for TB research. And I think that the um, McGill International TB Center really epitomizes the close collaborations and the interactions and how tightly interconnected we are between McGill and the Research Institute of the MUHC. And I know of the important role that MI4 has played in supporting many of the research projects within this important center. Um, we know that TB um, research is world leading at McGill and the contributions that have been made are truly impressive. And when I went back to look at the contributions, when I went back to look through PubMed, it was really interesting for me to note that the first paper from McGill was published in actually one, 135 years ago in 1889. That was the first paper that came out of the Department of Physiology um, where uh, McGill had contributed to the field of tuberculosis. And the title of the paper that was published by Wesley uh, Mills was Clinical and Pathological Notes from a Breeding Station, Scrofula and Tuberculosis in birds. But since then, we've come a long way. And there are almost 1,300 papers that have come out of McGill related to TB researchers. And I know that the contributions continue to grow. So the theme of vaccination is certainly very relevant today as we strive for improved and new therapies, especially in a field such as TB, which we know is the world's deadliest bacterial infection, which we've just heard from Maz, is responsible for almost 1.7 million deaths per year. And with the emergence of drug resistance to first-line antibiotic therapy in patients who've got TB, we certainly need to be doing better. And so looking at the future of vaccination is certainly extremely encouraging. And hence the theme of your symposium is so timely and so relevant. And with that, I want to say welcome again to our Research Institute. Thank you to um, the team, Maz, uh, Dr. Menzies, um, uh, Marcel, and others who have organized this very important research day. And thank you to the students who've contributed so much to the work that they've shared with us in their posters and presentations. And with that, I wish you a wonderful symposium. May you have lots of new great ideas and may we see the reality of vaccination to TB become a reality as soon as possible. So welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Towers. Uh, I guess uh, what we are going to start, we are going to start with the poster presentation. So there is uh, actually uh, two minutes for each presenter, time is very restrict. So I'm sorry, put my timer on and, and if it's above two, after two, two minutes, I will stop you. This will follow with three minutes of question and uh, the, the, the abstract is open to questioning from everyone in the audience. Um, so what I would like, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mina Sadegi to come and uh, start this uh, 
first uh, presentation. Thank you. Iron is a micronutrient that is constantly be being shuttled in the highway that is our body's circulatory system. The main function for iron is to de deliver oxygen to the tissues. And the journey begins when iron is loaded into hemoglobin and uh, in the process of erythropoiesis, which is the formation of a red blood cells or erythrocytes in the bone marrow. Um, Red blood cells circulate for 120 days, and after this, they become senescent. It's then that they're recycled by uh, splenic macrophages, and iron is removed from hemoglobin and sent back to the bone marrow. This is the highway of erythroid iron. Anemia is a condition defined by decreased levels of hemoglobin and has many different root causes. TB patients present with anemia, although the etiology of anemia in TB remains a topic of debate. Um, it's known in the literature that increased dietary iron is associated with an increased risk of, uh, of TB. And however, uh, iron deficiency is also associated with an increased risk of mortality. Given this uh, niche of iron in the bone marrow, in our lab's fervent study of MTB and its effects on bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells, we decided to start our study at the bone marrow. What we saw in the rapid kinetics of our MTB IV model was a very early onset depletion of the erythroid stem cells in the bone marrow. This was associated with iron overload, which led to cell death, a principle called ferroptosis. The consequences of this could be felt at the level of the blood where we saw decreased serum iron levels, mature red blood cells, and hemoglobin levels. But where is this big surge of iron coming from? It seems to be in the spleen, and we saw that these uh, splenic macrophages that recycle iron are actually sending way too much of it into the bone marrow. So overall, our study identifies an intricate system of detours and, and roadblocks of iron shuttling uh, during infection. And these findings can help us in elucidating new insights into the pathogenesis of this disease. In the IV model where you have an erythroid depletion in the bone marrow, do you also have other lineages that are suppressed? Um, yes, we do, but none so high as the erythroid uh, lineage. So we see a lot of modulation in at, in our central, in our mid-time point, uh, uh, 28 days after infection of the myeloid uh, lineage. Um, and we see that this is also um, uh, going down, and this impairs host defense and trained immunity downstream. But we have elucidated that the erythroid progenitors are proliferating less by KS67 signaling independent of the ancestor. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. So the next speaker is Elisa Jabbar. Sorry, I, I missed. I made a mistake. Elias Jabbar. I'm sorry, but no way. Good everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elias, and I'm a second year medical student at McGill. During this past summer, I had the I was a recipient of the McGill Global Health Scholar, and I had the opportunity to travel to Brazil to work on evaluating the cost of uh, tuberculosis activities under the supervision of Dr. Campbell and Dr. Trashman. Now, you may ask yourself, why Brazil? With a population of 218 million, Brazil is among the top 30 high burden country for TB, and has been recognized by the WHO as a priority for disease control in the world. This instigated the Brazilian government to upscale their screening and preventive strategies. And in order to do so, administrators must design the most cost-effective strategy within each step of the cascade of care. And so this is the part where my project comes in. During this work, I was in fact simultaneously able to explore my two top academic passions, research and shopping. Um, I'm sure some of you can resonate with that. Uh, basically, I worked on putting a dollar value on every, uh, every activity of TV care. When defining TB care, we divided them into five large groups. Uh, case finding, diagnosis of TB infection, treatment of TB infection, diagnosis of TB disease, and treatment of TB disease. 
This is the first study in Brazil to use a standardized approach to estimate cost by including a detailed list of prices, including pharmaceutical reagent, personnel cost, hardware, laboratory, machinery. We report a large variation in costs uh, within these activities. Household contacts and symptom screening were the cheapest items on our list with two to three dollars on average for each activity. Uh, cost of TB diagnosis for infection ranged around 49 to 58 dollars for adults. Cost of TB disease, however, was more expensive for, with a range of 583 to $596 and can rise up to $8,000 in certain scenarios of rifampin resistant TB. Overall, we demonstrate a large variation in cost of these activities at TB care, and this data can be leveraged to support the estimation of the cost of scaling up TB activities in Brazil and prioritizing screening uh, approaches for TB. Thank you. Hi, Elias. If I understand, you provided what we could call direct costs, the costs to the healthcare system, or did you also include indirect costs for the people who have to miss an afternoon of work or travel to the clinic and all the other repercussions to the patients and their family? Well, good question. So for this, we only looked at direct cost and we looked at it from the uh, public health care perspective, it should be mentioned. Um, this is because we most of, most of the TB activities are provided by the federal government and reimbursed for that. So the government provides the cost for the medication, hires some of the staff, not all of them. Um, and so we did not account for you know loss of productivity, as you mentioned, the, the cost of commuting, for example, to go to the clinic. Uh, it was really restricted to direct observations. Uh, thank you very much. So I was wondering, you know, the uh, the context, the epidemiological and social context in which disease happens is obviously very, very variable. For example, something I know from own experience, TB in prisons is absolutely omnipresent and a very large proportion of the population is incarcerated. So how did you deal with these different settings? For sure. So uh, I wasn't able to show that on the poster, but we took that into account. So there's different indication for different types of infection diagnostic tools that you would use. And as you mentioned, people living with, for example, people living in prisons would undergo, uh, I'm just gonna give you an example, IGRA instead of a TST. So we did take into account these different populations. Um, we also took into account children, pediatric population and adults, because they do receive different regimen dosages and that would translate into different costs. Um, there's also First Nations, people living with HIV. We considered all of those in the micro costs, but then we would have to create the different approaches for the algorithm of care in order to account for all these things in details. Thanks. Yes. Just a quick question. Did you consider the, or what's the uh, role of the private sector in Brazil? Was that taken into consideration? That's a very good uh, political question that we were able to witness there. Um, I'm going to say unfortunately, there's a lot of variation in who recruits whom in Brazil. Um, a large population, uh, sorry, a large, a large amount of the healthcare staff is recruited by third party organizations. Some of them are recruited by federal government, some of them are recruited by the city. And that was one of the problems we initially encountered when we were trying to kind of collect the salary of these personnel. At the end, we ended up creating a weighted average to account for all these things. So we were able to contact stakeholders from every city that we looked at and try to get an estimate of how, what is the proportion of people recruited by third party organization in community centers versus by, by the federal versus by the city versus by um, missing a layer. But basically we try to create an average of those and for, for salary purposes and created kind of an, like a representative uh, estimate of those. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So hello, I'm Kim, I'm a PhD student in Maz's lab. Um, as we all know, the BCG vaccine is currently the only licensed vaccine against tuberculosis and is given around the world to protect against a dissemin disseminated form of TB. However, epidemiological data has shown that BCG has this off-target protection, especially in countries with high infectious pressure. And from this resulted this long-standing idea that BCG affords nonspecific protections against different pathogens. Numerous studies has pointed to BCG's potent ability to induce trained immunity, where innate immune cells have an enhanced response against a secondary challenge. Um, however, when we investigated the BCG vaccine in the context of a viral influenza infection, we found that BCG in fact protects against influenza, 
influenza, but it was a subset of effector memory T cells that was essential for its protection. So T cells are known for their antigen specificity. So how could BCG specific T cells possibly protect against influenza? Well, immunization with BCG um, triggers this massive expansion of interferon gamma producing cells that can circulate into the lungs and there train proximal pulmonary immune cells and heighten their antimicrobial activity specifically alveolar macrophages, which are the first cells that the virus encounters. So this brings forth, forth a concept that adaptive immune cells can also feature in a first line of defense against unrelated pathogens. And although there's still a lot to learn about BCG, it provides insight in how BCG can harness both branches of the adaptive immune system to trigger trained immunity, where there's crosstalk between the innate and adaptive immune cells. Thank you. So, so I know most of your work has been done in a short time frame, but how long do you think this protection would last? So we've done um, vaccination up to six months post BCG, and we still found protection and reduction in viral load uh, of the influenza infection in the lungs. But do you think it would last five years, 10 years? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> So we saw that there was a direct correlation with the presence of these cells into the lungs with uh, the protection against influenza. And over time, the number of cells does wane. So I do think after maybe like a year or something, we don't see any of these cells anymore in the lung tissue. And so it, it wouldn't be protective as much. How does the efficacy of BCG against flu compare in the same model to the efficacy of a flu vaccine against flu? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, obviously, the, the flu vaccines are specific for that flu strain. And so I would expect the flu, although I've not compared it, I would expect the flu vaccine to be more effic eff efficient uh, protecting against the flu. But BCG is just used as a perhaps a preventative tool to trigger um, an immune response prior to the infection. Thanks. Uh, do you know anything about the identity of the T cells that mediate uh, that uh, protection against yes, influenza? We sure do. Uh, it, we, I, we identified the cells as six to zero one high T cells, which is a marker for identification of effector memory T cells. We did RNA sequencing to look at the gene expression and saw um, differential gene expression in T cell function genes and T cell migration. We also looked at their cytokine profile. So they produce more interferon gamma and TNF alpha and overall seem to be more um, functional in their effector function and migratory, migratory capacity. But these would not be typical pulmonary cells, right? They would have to be So called... they are BCG specific and mo mostly found in the circulation. Um, and we show that they're able to migrate into the lungs, which was essential for their protection. But whether they are special in any way, we don't really know. We just know they're BCG specific and they're effector memory. So a follow-up question to Michael's question. So what is the half lifetime of these cells in the periphery? Um, that's a good question. So we did a uh, experiment where we depleted, we, we treated the mice with antibiotics. So there was no more BCG and we saw the, the cells were still present in the circulation. We don't know if it's the same cells that were you know, generated at first, but we do see quite a long um, timeline of when the cells can be found in circulations. CD4 T cells, which are what these cells are, typically go down over time, whereas CD8 cells persist for a lot longer and can persist for a lifetime. But um, we think the CD4 cells will eventually wane and, and then go down in the circulation. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I'm Luke Harris. I'm a postdoc with uh, Dr. Vethi and Dr. Baer. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, this project for a most recent common ancestor of the tuberculosis complex and its application to uh, reference-based alignment of animal-associated lineages. And so um, in whole genome sequence analysis of mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, most workflows rely on lining short reads against a reference genome. That reference genome for a long time has been H37RV or sequences derived from it. 
Problem being, H37RV is lacking certain genomic regions called RVDs, and any uh, genome of interest that you're aligning against that reference genome would be unable to examine variability within those regions if that's the referent. And so we sought uh, initially, uh, we recently described a uh, imputed ancestral genome for the mycobacterium and tuberculosis complex that includes all, nearly all structural variation present in the complex. And here in this work, we took this new um, imputed ancestral sequence and aligned 6,500 animal adapted uh, genomes uh, from public databases and looked at the comparative performance of this uh, ancestral sequence as a referent versus H37RV. Using uh, this ancestral sequence, we call about, on average, six more SNPs uh, relative to H37RV, although lineage calls and assignments uh, with uh, either reference sequence are very similar. Finally, most and most importantly, we can demonstrate uh, the value of an imputed ancestral sequence as a short read referent uh, for examining regions of structural variation, particularly where structural variation includes deletions in reference sequences. So for the RD7 region is a good example where RD7 overlaps with an RVD. And so to really look and understand the evolution of those regions of difference and deletions, we need a reference sequence that captures the structural variability and the structural um, complement of the entire mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. You can talk over the phone, the microphone, please. Sorry. Um, so the question is that we know the mutation rate in MTB is very low. Do you also see any differences in terms of the mutation rate in different strains of the MTB that you study? So it's a very good question. Um, we didn't look at the mutation rate in a sort of temporally explicit fashion in, in this particular work, although certainly the the concept of the, of the MTBC not uh, or this imputed ancestral sequence could be used to do time calibrated phylogenetic analysis and explicitly reconstruct uh, mutation rates in each lineage. In fact, that's a, a good idea. <laughs> Hi. Uh, how flexible is this genome? I mean, as new lineages come up and they're deposited on NCBI, is this something that you can update, like lineage 10 that came out about this yeah. month? Yeah. So it's a good question. So this concept of, of imputing an ancestral genome, of course, is dependent on the sampling that was used to create it. And it's the sampling was done using a hierarchical, and the alignment was done using a reference-free hierarchical alignment. And this is a more modern uh, genome alignment method. And one of the advantages is that you can add genomes to that alignment and subsequently update uh, up the tree and iterate uh, and refine the estimation of the ancestral genome uh, as more data becomes available. So, so yes, uh, so it will evolve. Any other questions? Yes, Michael. Um, Interesting talk and, and poster. So of the currently, let's call them viable MTBC strains around the world, which one do you think is is the closest to this putative ancestor? Uh, so it's a good question. I would think, I would say the answer is probably lineage eight. So there's two genomes that have been described from Africa um, that are form lineage eight. The problem is there's a very long branch between uh, the current genomes of lineage eight and the root, but that would be probably the genomes that are closest to the ancestral uh, genome of the MTBC. That or there's a recently described on the other side, just outside the complex, there's a very close outgroup that's recently been described uh, as a, no one's really sure what to call it, but it's probably a, a strain of M. Kinetti uh, called ET1291 that's also recently been described. So there'll be those three. Hello. Hi, I'm Oscar. I work with in the Mass Lab as well. Um, today I'm going to be telling you about my project, which uh, involves tuberculosis, erythropoiesis, and erythropoietin. Um, tuberculosis is primarily a pulmonary pathogen, although it can also systemic systemically disseminate, causing extrapulmonary tuberculosis, infecting secondary sites such as the liver, the spleen, the bone marrow, and the kidney. Um, TB patients also 
uh, often clinically pre present with anemia. Um, and this anemia physiologically would be corrected by um, the production of more red blood cells through erythropoiesis. This is a process that is governed by two main signals, iron, which you already heard about from MENA, and EPO or erythropoietin. Um, I'll be focusing more on erythropoietin, not to step on MENA's toes. Um, erythropoietin production is majorly in the adult performed by the kidney. Um, and ki the kidney can also be infected by tuberculosis in renal tuberculosis. Um, so we wanted to draw a, a common thread between renal, renal tuberculosis, production of EPO, and anemia. So as Mina has previously established, we have shown that in our systemic IV model of TB infection, there is uh, an anemia that is formed as early as day seven. And we showed that there was no erythropoietin induction in response to that anemia in the kidney. Um, we thought that this was possibly due to kidney pathology. And we did see an increase in colonization of the kidney as early as day seven, as well as um, interstitial immune cell infiltration, fibrosis, and acute kidney injury markers. Um, we are working now to uh, find out what the role of that damage is in the production of EPO by the kidney and why it is suppressed during TB infection, and also possibly the cause of that, that damage. Hi, Oscar. Thank you for that. When we see patients with disseminated mycobacterium avium, they'll also be anemic. Are the processes you're describing specific to TB, or do you think these would be generic to other disseminated mycobacterial infections? That's a great question. Um, I can tell you that, well, actually, I have a couple, couple of components to answer this question. First, I can tell you that when we uh, intravenously give mycobacterium bovis saliva tenuine strain, BCG, it colonizes the kidney but not, does not cause the same anemia. Um, I would also say in terms of the mycobacterium avium, I am not fully sure as it's not my area, but I'm fairly sure that part of that uh, anemia is caused by interferon gamma signaling in the bone marrow and, and a depression of erythropoiesis. And that's not something that we've necessarily looked in, into in our TB model. So I think it might be through, through different mechanisms and different mycobacterial infections. Uh, if uh, you consider that uh, the lung involvement may be different in fibrosis, or <clears throat> if uh, you consider that the lung involvement may be different between the patient in the fibrosis or the cavitary lesion, it, does it uh, affect your study that uh, to, to uh, uh, induce the air support in front of the kidney or not? The severity of the pulmonary disease? Exactly. Mm. That's a great question. That's that's not something that I've really looked into the literature on. But I would presume if if there's a more severe uh, pulmonary infection, you would have increased increased dissemination to the, the circulation and increased dissemination to the kidney, and with more uh, bacterial load in the kidney, I would guess that you would have more severe pathology there as well. Thank you. So hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about mycobacterial peptidoglycan and its study through BCG vaccination. So mycobacterial peptidoglycan is very unique in the bacterial world. Indeed, it's done uh, through uh, its N-glycolyl MDP, which is a chemical modification done by an hydroxylase encoded by a NAMH gene. So this NAMH gene is conserved across all mycobacteria. And this modification is, um, is giving so an N-glycolyl MDP that has an increased recognition by the NOT2 uh, intracellular receptor, so the receptor of TB. And uh, this uh, gives us a route to better understand the mechanisms underlying BCG interaction with its host. So that's why I focus on BCG. So I use BCG Russia uh, as a strain. I knocked out NAMH, so to get rid of the glycolylation of this MDP. So to do that, uh, we used an onycholytic uh, recombinant system to knock out the gene. We showed that we knocked it out. 
biochemically that we've lost the modification of the peptidoglycan. And then we saw that through BMDM infection, we had less immune response from cytokines, especially TNF alpha. And then we moved on into in vivo studies to show that uh, we have, whether we had a modification in protection to BCG um, wild type or BCG delta NH that, lo that has lost that modification, but we didn't see any difference in that. Still, uh, this modification um, is very interesting because it's conserved across all microbacteria, yet it has a higher recognition by the host. So we, we can wonder why microbacteria kept that modification and what role it has in infection. So I'm wondering, do we know if there is any difference between MDP from BCG versus MDP from the virulent strain of MTB? Um, well, just the MDP, yes. it should be the same between all of the microbacterial um, species. So this is an MDP which has a modification that's glycolylated if NAMH is present. Yes, but do, do you think if you isolate MDP from MTB, will yeah. be the same thing that MDP from the BCG strain? strain? Yeah. I think so, yeah. It's been experimentally done or? Question? Yes, Evan. So I have a question regards the other side of your story. You didn't tell us anything about which kind of host component are you using when you are testing that? Can you elaborate a little bit? On the host component? Yeah, um, you use different mice, right? Exactly. So what mice are these? And yeah. do you use transgenics? Yeah, do you yeah. also use cell lines where you then can use? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so on. So for the cell lines, we use BMDM, so bone marrow-derived macrophages, to do the infections with the, uh, BCG wild type and BCG delta NAMH. And for the mice, we use black six mice that were uh, vaccinated uh, 10 weeks prior to the infection. It's more interested in the genetic background, you know. So exactly which variants of the key genes are involved in this interaction with either peptidoglycan mm -hmm. or BCG? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Uh, which variant of my, my cells? Not, you know, what exactly, which kind of knot do you have in there? Is there anything specific? I don't know. Marcel knows for sure, but I don't. <laughs> For my uh, cell works, I used both wild type BMDMs and not to uh, knock out mice BMDMs. Is yes, <laughs> this is what we would. Yeah, okay. I used both. Any other question? I'll, I'll ask a quick one. Yes, I didn't. I didn't get time to look at your poster. Sorry, but your mouse protection assay. What was that? Was that based on CFU or animal survival? It was animal survival. So we vaccinated mice with both BCG wild type and Delta NAMH, and then we infected them 10 weeks um, afterwards uh, with uh, Mycobacterium origins. So it was a survival. We also had a PPS group, of course, to uh, check uh, if we had the death phenotype that we were expecting, and BCG too. Okay. But did you vaccinate them by IV? Uh, no, by CFQ. Uh, okay, the next speaker is, thank you very much. The next speaker is actually Tina Newcomb. Hello, my name is Christina and I am also in the Dibangahi lab. BCG, a live attenuated vaccine used to prevent tuberculosis, has also demonstrated broad cross-protection against other pathogens, possibly through the induction of trained immunity. Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, certain groups wanted to determine whether or not BCG could also protect against SARS-CoV-2. Literature is quite divided, with some studies, such as one from our own lab, demonstrating no protection, while others, such as one by Hilligan et al., demonstrating protection. Upon investigation, we noted that our studies differed in strain usage, BCG Tyson R study and BCG Pester in the Hilligan study, as well as growth conditions, cultured in R study and frozen in the Hilligan study. Using their conditions and time course, but with our own strains, 
we were able to show that now BCG Tice, when frozen, could protect against SARS-CoV-2. And so we wanted to determine how it was that these frozen BCG strains could protect against SARS-CoV-2. Using an organ CFU assay, we demonstrated that frozen BCG pester significantly increased bacterial loads in the lungs compared to the frozen BCG Tice groups. Interested in the lungs, we decided to also focus on the lymphoid and myeloid populations through the use of immunophenotyping. We noted initially in the myeloid populations in the lungs that there was a significantly increased proportion of MHC class II positive alveolar macrophages and Lysix C high monocytes in the frozen BCG vaccinated groups compared to the control group, with no sustained changes between Pester or Tice. Similarly, in the lymphoid populations, we noted a significantly increased proportion of NK cells and T cells, particularly CX3CR1 memory T cells in these frozen BCG vaccinated groups compared to the control groups, with again, no sustained changes between Pester or Tice. Recent literature demonstrates that there is a key role of interferon gamma in the protection against SARS-CoV-2, and with CX3CR1 memory T cells being a key producer of the cytokine, we would like to turn our attention to interferon gamma in hopes to better understand how it is that frozen BCG strains can protect against SARS-CoV-2. Hi, great talk. So I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of a fan of BCG. So the first thing is that you looked at two late strain BCGs, mm -hmm. which we know are phenotypically different from early strains. Yes. So how do you think that that would apply to an early strain? Would you find the same protection? If so, why? And the second question is, how would you translate frozen BCG clinically? Mm -hmm. So to answer your first question, um, a lot of studies that have been studying this mainly been focusing on the later strains. Pester and Tice are really two of the most popular ones. When it comes to the earlier strains, I believe that the strain difference itself, while it might, while it might somewhat affect the actual protection, I do believe that it is really the growth condition that is the main effector of whether or not there is protection. So possibly an earlier strain might provide differential protection compared to a later strain, but I really do believe that it is this growth condition. And as for the growth conditions, uh, well, there has also been studies shown that lyophilized BCG also does protect against SARS-CoV-2. And given that, well, BCG vaccines do tend to be lyophilized, we can still in fact see that there is protection. Thanks for that. When you compare fresh versus frozen BCG, can you determine the ratio of live to dead bacteria that you're delivering into the animal? Very good question. We are actually about to do that. Uh, we would like to perform a bacterial CFU assay in order to assess this actual ratio of the frozen to live bacteria. I haven't done that yet, but we would like to, as we believe that this actually might play a major role in the actual difference in protection. I have a, sorry, I didn't have time to attend your poster, but what do you mean by frozen BCG? I, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, by frozen BCG, I mean that the they took stocks that had been frozen at minus 80 and then rapidly thawed them and vaccinated with this. Sorry if this is a, an ignorant question. It kind of follows up on, on Alain's question. Mm -hmm. um, What's the, uh, the, so there's lyophilized, there's these freeze-thawed vaccines, uh, is, is yeah. there non-frozen? Uh, so what we did in our study is that we took BCG and we grew it to the log phase. And then once these bacteria were at the log phase, we vaccinated them with this. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Simran and I work as a research assistant with Dr. Dick Menzies. So due to a lack of um, evidence for preventive treatment for MDR-TB, two clinical trials were recently run in South Africa and Vietnam for the safety and efficacy of levofloxacin. However, despite suggestive evidence that it may be effective, um, there's still one question that remains. So even if this treatment works, will patients actually take this treatment? So the WHO asked us to run a qualitative study of acceptability of a hypothetical treatment regimen um, to assess if this treatment was implemented, how many people would actually be willing to take the treatment. Um, 
to do this, we uh, conducted interviews one-on-one uh, -on -one with 36 household contacts of MDRTB. And we found that although there were a small number of people that were certain yeses or fixed noes, uh, most people were willing to take the treatment if we um, played around with some of the treatment parameters. So in terms of treatment parameters, um, the most important was the efficacy. So um, the higher the efficacy, the more people were willing to tolerate risk of side effects and long treatment durations. And next in importance was side effects and then treatment duration and a lower pill burden. However, aside from treatment parameters, there were some other uh, factors that uh, influenced the decision. The first being uh, the context and MGRTB knowledge. Um, so the more people were familiar with MGRTB and felt that they were personally at risk, uh, the more they were willing to tolerate uh, worse treatment parameters, such as longer duration and risk of side effects. Um, Next was that many people struggled with the concept of preventive treatment or did not seem to value it, with some people questioning, um, if I'm not sick right now, why would I take this treatment that would give me side effects or potentially actually make me sick? And then last was concerns about, concerns about uh, feasibility. So that was, if I do have side effects, will I be able to take care of my family members that actually have the disease and are working with the symptoms of the disease? So all this to say, um, if and when an MDRTB preventive treatment regimen is recommended, um, feasibility concerns should be eased and counseling should be provided to patients. Thank you. So is that the question? Hi, um, I know for sort of knowledge mobilization and activities, this was obviously funded by WHO and I, obviously the information goes back to them, but. I'm curious if you were able to provide any sort of information back to the site. So if knowledge, for example, was found to be lacking or like of a main concern amongst the um, contacts, were you able to feed that back so they could increase education, for example? Um, so um, we're kind of waiting to complete the uh, data analysis still. So we, there's still some certain aspects that we have to kind of finalize before uh, dispensing the information to the sites but they will be informed um, when the quality of analysis is completed. And uh, some, of the, um, some of the people that were in the, in the clinical um, the study sites, they were part of the WHO guidelines development group. So they heard about the results of the study and how much information actually mattered uh, for patients and, and informing the decision, yeah. John? Thanks, Sam. Um, I guess my question is how Similar are these findings to regular TPT because six months levofloxacin has been is about the same duration as what most countries have been using for the last twenty years or so, or you know twenty plus years. Yeah. So are there different things that people value because they're a contact of someone with drug resistant TB, or is it about the same? Yeah. So for people that were aware of the differences between the seriousness of MDR TB and drug susceptible TB, um, they were willing to accept. Uh, longer durations, but it, it, like within the, the population in general, um, I think the main things that uh, affected the decision, so that was efficacy, was about the same uh, for drug susceptible TB. Um, and in terms of duration, um, it also mattered um, how frequently they, they took the medication as well. So they were willing to take shorter duration uh, medication if that meant that, you know, it's more effective, even if it meant taking more pills. So uh, yeah, it's a bit different, but yeah. Since Jonathan asked my question, damn it. Um, I was wondering, have these kind of studies been done for other diseases like post-exposure prophylaxis and HIV or pre-travel prophylaxis for malaria? And do we have any differences or similarities of acceptability questionnaires across diseases? Um, I haven't actually looked into um, other diseases, um, but in terms of uh, the questionnaires, we did try to um, follow the sort of things that are specific to TB. Um, so uh, knowledge, knowledge about the disease, I think would be kind of common for all diseases, um, but in terms of, um, um, so like transmission of the disease, we kind of inform them if they did not know about TB specifically so that they can make an informed decision. But I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.
Hi, I've been informed by Maz that although he's the MC, he's not inviting, uh, bringing up the next speaker. Uh, probably because I reached out to Joanne and asked her to come today, and she graciously agreed to come. And then what Maz did is he didn't leave me the speaker's notes with the bio. So <laughs> what I can tell you is Joanne Langley is a pediatric infectious disease doctor from Halifax, who I know best um, from a few years ago, I was giving a talk in Halifax, and I pulled out this classic paper that I was telling Maz about which is called the poker player's pneumonia. And she described what happens when a bunch of people in an illegal gambling hall uh, gather around a cat that delivers and the placenta sheds them with Q fever. And uh, then she's gone on to an incredibly illustrious career in vaccinology, leading Canadian networks. And she's here to tell us her lessons from all the other vaccines she studied about we, what we in the TB world should be thinking about if people in this room come up with a new TB vaccine, are we even prepared of what follows in the clinical trials ahead? So thank you so much, Joanne, for joining us. And I hope something I said resembles what's written here. Thank you so much. And uh, just delightful to be here. And um, of course, I know about the, the center here, but uh, I want to thank you for all your work. I mean, 1,300 papers, that is pretty amazing. Um, but it just shows what happens when you bring people together. And for those of you that are young in your careers, they're, they're, that is actually a studied phenomena, that if you have researchers within 60 feet of each other, they're more likely to be productive than if they're on different floors or buildings or whatever. So congratulations. So uh, I'll start with my disclosures. Uh, the first paragraph is uh, volunteer activities, so there's no money involved. And the second paragraph is uh, research grants. Uh, I work at this Canadian Centre for Vaccinology, and we do industry uh, grants as well as investigator-initiated ones, and all the money goes to Dalhousie University. So this is a big week for tuberculosis. This is uh, announced on the 19th of March, so this past Tuesday that the first phase three trial of a tuberculosis vaccine is launched. It's funded by the Gates and by Wellcome. It's going to enroll 20,000 uh, people, adults. They're aimed at the uh, adult age group, uh, attempt to prevent pulmonary TB. It's going to enroll IGRA positive uh, adults, and then there'll be two sub-cohorts of IGRA negative and HIV positive but IGRA negative. And this is pretty exciting. This uh, vaccine has already been studied in phase two. It's um, a protein-based vaccine with a, a two antigens from TB, 32A uh, and 39A, combined with a liposome. It's an adjuvant developed by GSK that includes a saponin and um, a TLR4 agonist. Uh, and the phase two studies were about 50% efficacy. So this is pretty exciting. However, we will need more than this vaccine, even if this one is successful. That has been the story throughout vaccine science, is that we need multiple kinds of vaccines, both for the acceptability and the immunogenicity in different populations, but the uh, product supply may crash at any one time for a vaccine. Um, so there's still lots of work to do. So I'd like to consider the framework in which clinical development of vaccines occurs and share some learning about the some aspects of clinical trial methods that um, are we've learned in the field and uh, work left to do. So uh, every country, at least some countries, have an analytic framework in which they consider immunization programs. This is the Canadian one. And I'm hoping you're working on a vaccine for our population, and maybe we need a special vaccine for our population. Uh, and every time you think of a new vaccine, even before you go to the bench and try and develop it, you need to think of through these aspects because they have to do with the likely success of an actual program. So obviously there has to be a burden of disease. Um, we always focus on the vaccine safety and efficacy However, there's all these other aspects, and some of them were referred to uh, today in some of the trainee presentations. The immunization strategy in the program, cost effectiveness, we're going to hear about modeling later, the acceptability of the program. There's no point making a vaccine if people won't use it. Feasibility of implementing it, 
in Quebec, particularly the ability to evaluate programs. Uh, Quebec is really a leader in Canada in terms of never implementing a population program without already figuring out how they're going to evaluate it. None of the rest of us do that very well. And this um, analytic framework was actually uh, co-developed by Philippe de Waals, who's one of your uh, scientists that worked for INSPQ and at Université Laval. So these are all these other considerations that are worth thinking about. Now, clinical trials as a methodology in science is so important because of how we evaluate and value vaccines. So you don't have to look at the detail of this particular graphic to know that it looks complicated. It's actually the um, grade uh, from the grade handbook for evaluating vaccines that immunization decision-making committees use like ASIP in the US or NACI in Canada. And um, what happens in this framework is that there's a systematic tool for collecting all the evidence you want to see, synthesizing it, putting it in tables according to research design, and then deciding whether or not you believe it. And in general, clinical trials high, highly outrank any other trial method, uh, even if you have a super well done observational trial. So um, throughout every kind of ranking system, GRADE is probably the most frequently used one now across the world. Randomized control trials without important limitations uh, trump everything else and observational and other designs are relegated to a purgatory that it's very hard for them to get out of, even if they have some of these uh, characteristics of very good uh, design. So um, with that in mind, let's think about the clinical development of vaccines. And the life cycle approach is one that most regulatory agencies um, take which means that a vaccine is not just the one moment that you produce it and get it approved. It actually has a life cycle where you may use it differently over time. And a great example of that is BCG vaccine. So the first phase of the life cycle is the discovery phase where you're um, deciding on the antigen, whether you need an adjuvant, you're characterizing the immune response looking at animal models of toxicity and infection and immunity and coming up with what formulation, what vial you can put it in, can you actually manufacture it? At some point, you'll have enough evidence that you'll be able to go to the regulator and ask for a clinical trial authorization. And that is a, when you start a phase one trial or a first in humans trial, and they're very small. They're 20 to 50 people who are healthy. So they tend to be 18 to 40 year olds in that first trial. And you're basically looking at, is this safe? You may vaccinate people every hour instead of all at once, just to watch for any safety signal. Then you move into phase two in which you may enroll up to hundreds of people looking at different dosages, different populations. You're moving towards your tar target population, which may not be healthy adults, 18 to 40. Uh, and then if that all goes well, and many, many vaccines, in fact, most vaccines, most therapeutics do not get from phase two to phase three. But if the work is good and it looks promising, you will amass the funding to do a phase three trial, which is really your proof of efficacy trial. It's sometimes called a, a pivotal trial. These are tremendously expensive. And if the phase three trial goes well, you, the sponsor or the manufacturer may decide that there isn't a case for this vaccine. A ex recent example is the Janssen COVID vaccine. So that vaccine was efficacious, but one might ask, what is the climate now for adenovirus vectored vaccines in mass programs? Um, Janssen decided to stop its program development, even though they had a good vaccine. Um, if the vaccine does go into the market, we call that phase four or post-market uh, stage of vaccine development. And at that point, there's a lot we still do not know about the vaccine. We don't know how long immunity will last. 
We don't know if there'll be indirect protection. So direct protection is the protection that the vaccinated person has. Indirect protection is that afforded to people who weren't vaccinated. So the pneumococcal vaccine, the streptococcus pneumonia vaccine, protein conjugate that was introduced in around 2005 um, in North America was rolled out into infant programs. And over the next three to five years, it was observed that invasive pneumococcal disease in older adults was going down. But those folks were just getting Pneumovax, which is a polysaccharide vaccine that doesn't work so well. Eventually, it was worked out that the vaccine in infants was decreasing colonization in the nasal pharynx. They weren't shedding it to anyone else. And so older adults were protected. That's indirect protection. Then there's also rarer adverse events that you're not going to see in those phase one, two, or three studies just because the maximum sample size may be 50,000. So you may not see an adverse event that occurs one in 100,000. So that's why we need to do surveillance. And not all public health programs do that. So back to the life cycle then, we're in phase four. It's a, a period of intense learning, and that can lead to changes in the way we use vaccines. So it is also important. Now, some of the lessons learned about clinical trials I wanted to share today are listed here. One is the search for a correlative protection. Another is safety planning and the importance of that. Some of the movements that are afoot to improve clinical trials and also to always consider the global context. And that takes us back to Maz's very first slide when he talked about the Nobel laureate who said we always have to think globally. <clears throat> so this is an analytic framework for immunization that's used by the US task force. And you could think, why am I using a vaccine? Well, I have people at risk and I wanna prevent disease and morbidity. It's basically the reason. But we know that it's very expensive and laborious to use only the method of seeing if it prevents disease as part of your development plan. So we'd really like for there to be an intermediate outcome, something that in some way is associated with that clinical outcome. And that is sometimes called a correlate or a surrogate or an intermediate outcome. Uh, and that can be a, a number of immune responses, an innate immune response, adaptive, uh, and so on. However, you can see from this published record of all accepted immune correlates of vaccine protection from the middle column that they're all antibody responses. So we do not have any standardized, validated, interlaboratory confirmed uh, cell mediated immune response, innate immune response correlates of protection against vaccines. This is a problem, particularly for TB, because we think that is one of the main mechanisms, uh, if not the most important mechanism of protection. But now that these particular vaccines have this correlative protection, it means when they want to look at a new vaccine or change the way they use it, they don't have to do this huge randomized control trial. They can use the serologic correlate, correlate which is a much smaller, more efficient way of finding out that information. Now, when we think of correlates of protection, we think, okay, that is actually how the vaccine protects. But that is not the case. So something that's a true correlate is an immune response that's actually mechanicalistically responsible for protection as well as being statistically correlated. But that is not the case for all um, correlates. Something can be an absolute correlate, so it's highly correlated but it also could be relative. It might be because there's other things that are accounting for infection or protection, and that's only measuring part of that phenomenon. A co-correlate is one or two more factors that correlate with protection in additive or synergistic or alternate ways. And finally, a surrogate is an immune response that substitutes for the true immunologic correlate of protection but the immune response that's protecting the patient or the vaccinee is not known, or it's not easily measurable. It just may not be feasible to measure that in uh, clinical trials. 
Next is the role of safety planning uh, in the clinical trial and post-market. So um, both in the post-market phase and in clinical practice and in clinical trials, we use this term called adverse events following immunization, sometimes shortened to ACE. And that is any untoward occurrence that occurs following immunization. So obviously, if you have a peanut butter sandwich after you get your vaccine and you're allergic to peanuts and you have a rash, that is not causally related, but it could be captured as an AFI in a clinical trial. And that's because we're trying not to miss any adverse events that could occur because we don't want to exclude them based on the knowledge we had going into the trial. We may not know what adverse events there might be. And also we have a control group and the rate should be different if it is actually related to the vaccine. We also have an internationally accepted um, standard approach for calling something common, very common, rare, and uh, the, they have various figures with them. So during vaccine development, you can see that because our sample size is increasing, we have an increasing ability to capture adverse events following immunization. And then at the end of the trial, we compare those adverse events in the control group to the, those that are vac in the vaccine group, because at that point it's unblinded. And if you ever look at a product monograph, in the monograph, the list, all the things that ever occurred, even whether or not they were causally related. Now, safety planning in the clinical trial is very important. A data safety management committee is our usually your colleagues, but not involved in the trial, who are good clinicians or good scientists who can make judgments about whether the trial should stop, change, or continue at various points. So they have a lot of power in really shutting down huge clinical development programs. And so we know to choose those folks wisely. Um, we also need action plans if a potential safety signal is identified to deal with the safety issues, but also because something might be a safety signal, but it's actually not a safety event. So for example, with the HPV vaccine, when it rolled out into programs, we heard about um, in high school, in junior high schools, a lot of fainting, but it was originally called syncope. There was the vaccine was associated with syncope, but it was actually the pain response in a mass setting that was associated with it, but it came out as a safety signal and it takes a while to figure it out. Uh, communications plans are also very important. A recent example of a vaccine that um, was withdrawn from its clinical development program is the GSK, RSV maternal vaccine. And this is a vaccine that was probably two decades in the making. And there was a safety signal of uh, increased premature births. It wasn't statistically significant, but it was enough that GSK and the DSMB decided to halt the program. That's written in this uh, month's, uh, this week's New England Journal. And there's an editorial as well about this issue. Uh, it's open access, so um, you should be able to read it very uh, thoughtful approach to this safety signal. For post-market surveillance, we do not have as robust a system in Canada as one could with enough money, I guess. We have passive surveillance systems where uh, if you, have a, as a healthcare provider, even as a patient, have an adverse event, you can report that through an online form. And the, the sponsors also have to uh, report in annually on any events that were reported to them. For influenza and COVID, we had some active surveillance programs, uh, which uh, are listed here, and they worked very well to identify early events and late events. Uh, thirdly, I just want to mention the things that are afoot to improve clinical trials. Phase three trials are very complex endeavors. It's like a whole organization with thousands of people working in it, all assigned to various activities for two to three to four years. Um, they're very, very rigorous, and uh, they're a major investment, uh, up to a billion dollars, really. So this is 
again, another slide that I don't expect you to read just to show how complex it is. The, some of the complexity though, it's been wondered whether it's really necessary and whether it correlates with scientific integrity of the study or with ensuring patient safety, particularly the use of uh, clinical research organizations and vendors who specialize in the documentation associated with clinical trials. And there may be a lot of research waste uh, that is associated with that way of doing clinical trials. All of this work is to meet an international standard called ICH, the International Council of Harmonization, which came into effect in 1990. And really all trials where you wanna develop a product uh, that will go to your regulator in your country um, and are likely to go to another country should have to follow this, this format. And Health Canada regularly audits tri study sites to make sure that that is the case. But they're guidelines and they're not always clear about what it is that they're expecting, which sometimes can lead to excess um, uh, legalization of the way you do a trial. So one initiative that's come up is something called Good Clinical Trials. And this is an international consortium of researchers and funders um, who are aimed at enabling good randomized trials. So things like, is the data collecting you're collecting commensurate with the information needs of the trial? Or are you collecting too much information? Is the consent proportionate to the risk that the patient is undergoing? Some of these consents are 35 pages long for trials that we do. Um, so those are some of the things it's dealing with and uh, we'll see where this effort goes. Lastly, I wanted to mention um, the global context and really the earth is one country when it comes to vaccine development because uh, it's not sustainable to develop a vaccine for only one country's market, generally speaking, if it's a commercial process. Um, you need to have more than one market. And so you need to consider the other regulators. And uh, so in the development process, you're looking around the world to see as everyone else want the same things. So some of the things that are striving and pulling us up to these international standards are all these guidelines and rules and ways of doing things that standardizes our work. There's also a World Health Organization pre-qualification process for vaccines. So this is a service provided by the WHO to assess quality, safety, and efficacy of medicinal products, including vaccines. It was uh, intended to uh, amass a group of products that the, U the WHO could use in any of the low or middle income countries that it serves with the um, funded programs like the uh, childhood immunization programs. Uh, but during COVID, you'll know that um, the COVAX initiative uh, aimed to have all the vaccines that were used in that be ones that had WHO pre-qualification. So if you get this pre-qualification, then your vaccine can be used in multiple countries around the world and would have already be, be at the level to be acceptable in all the high income countries. Globally, we also have a number of processes where we identify the biggest infectious disease threats to the world's peoples. And then come for those that are the highest priority, global strategies to deal with them. This is the front page for the global TB program. So it's one of the uh, priority diseases for all the reasons that you know about. And you can see it's got vaccines, but it also has diagnostics. Um, ways of care for patients. It's really very comprehensive in its approach. One of the things they do when they develop a uh, prospective vaccine development program for a priority disease is come up with preferred product characteristics. So for TB vaccines, there's a number of preferred product characteristics because we probably need a different vaccine for adolescents and adults than we do for children, for example. We may need another different vaccine for uh, immunosuppressed people, we'll see. 
This is the preferred product characteristic profile for a tuberculosis vaccine for adolescents and adults. And this is the highest priority of the TB vaccines, this particular age group, because this is the age group that gets pulmonary disease and then spreads it. So most disease is being transmitted by this group. Um, whereas children are seen to be a lower priority because they're just fewer are affected uh, in the current paradigm. So uh, there's various parameters of each uh, uh, product profile. In this case, the efficacy should be at least 50%. The duration should be uh, 10 years or more. They will actually do an analysis at two years to decide whether to uh, bring the vaccine into the program. It should be very safe, such as mild transient events, no serious AEs. A minimal number of doses, that's a practicality issue. Uh, there's no requirement for co-administration. And the identification of a correlate is seen as very important. And in fact, this is now done in almost all phase three trials. So you have the opportunity in the context of a large phase three trial, you're measuring the clinical outcome. If you take blood or whatever immune uh, sampling you need to do, uh, you can then correlate it with the people that were protected or not protected to attempt to come up with an actual surrogate. And then programmatic suitability, and then the whole value proposition. Are you using more resources uh, than, you, uh, than you want to spend or are able to spend? So the um, WHO World TB program also keeps track of all the vaccines that are out there. And you can see that there's about five platforms that are currently being used, whole cell, whole cell live, inactivated whole cell, protein subunit. So here is the one that's being trialed right now, the uh, M72 ASO1E. Um, viral vectored are also being looked at and mRNA. There are some particular challenges to TB development. There's no animal model disease that really correlates with human infection. As we said, there's no established immune correlate, but I think Maz is going to tell us about that. It's going to solve that problem, so that's good. Um, there's no controlled human infection model. Uh, these are the challenge studies that you've probably heard about. And then there's multiple possible outcomes. You can think about prevention of disease, prevention of recurrence of infection, prevention of um, sustained de, no de novo infection. Those are all important, but you kind of have to think through in your trial design, which you will do. Another challenge is where the trials will have to be done. So this is the rate of new tuberculosis cases per 100,000 population with the darkest colors being the highest incidence. So um, other than Greenland, South America, Africa, so generally low and middle income countries where there are particular challenges to doing clinical trials where you have to follow a patient for years after they get their vaccine. And you check in with them every respiratory illness they have that might be TB because the laboratory the outcome for this particular trial is laboratory confirmed TB. Um, so you need a sputum sample or some respiratory prep sample and you need to be in touch with that participant uh, for quite a long period of time. So I think the, the uh, perspective though is one of optimism. This is uh, the closest to another tuberculosis vaccine beyond BCG that we've been, and it's almost is it 100 years since BCG uh, came into practice. So uh, these are exciting times, but as I say, we do need more than one vaccine, and we need to understand how the vaccines that we do have work, uh, and we may need different vaccines for different populations, as well as the whole sustainability of the biomanufacturing enterprise requires that we not put all our eggs in one basket. So thank you very much. All right, I know I have a question, but I'm gonna look around for some, are there people in Zoom land who have a question? And if so, how will I know? Is that what that little finger is up or? None so far. None so far. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, right here first. Uh, for animal model that you told, uh, 
can we work with the primates or technical problem or ethic problem uh, uh, prohibit us to work with them? So the uh, primate model of disease. Um, so uh, primate models are extremely expensive, um, as you probably know. Um, and I am not up to date on the the primate literature for, for tuberculosis challenge. Are you aware of that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Th there are non-human primate models of TB and whether they can be used as a gate, a stage gate towards human study or whether they're used for experimental immunology is still somewhat debated. And the other problem is some primate communities get TB mm. outbreaks mm. And, and that can be really catastrophic. So uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, my question, given the context, like uh, during COVID-19, which is not even classified as a pandemic anymore, but in many low and middle income countries, getting access to a standard COVID-19 vaccine is still a dream or it's, still, or it's not possible at all. Uh, so after so many years of being go going through the pandemic, now as a public health professional, I'm very excited to see that we are in the third phase of clinical trial. But given the context that all the TB cases happen, most of the TB cases happen in low and middle income countries who are already suffering with the access to COVID-19 vaccine, taking into account all of that, how optimistic would we be in terms of the development of the vaccine and the accessible population we really require will have access to it? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. So uh, COVID-19 vaccines, um, one of the major findings was that although we did have quite a lot of global sharing mechanisms and to some extent the COVAX mechanism, which was the first of its kind where countries actually had to buy in to supply themselves, like put their uh, kind of skin in the game as it were, um, did have some successes, but ultimately there was vaccine that arrived in Africa that sat on tarmacs. And by the time it got to them, there was so much uh, pushback about vaccines that many people didn't get it. And some places it didn't get delivered, as you point out. The, the, the clinical development program was really in the high income countries for the, one, the vaccines that ended up being successful, which were the most successful were the mRNA, mRNAs. And those were, as much as we don't like some of the politicians in the US, the, the, the funding program for that was through something called Warp Speed that happened from the administration where they actually de-risked the development of those vaccines and paid for the trials and paid for the scale up so the countries didn't have to, except for the Pfizer vaccine where Germany put money into that particular vaccine. Um, for this paradigm of the TB vaccines, it's all based with the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome and the WHO. The primary target, I think, is low and middle income countries. Just like the malaria vaccine, which is being rolled out in low in Africa, right, as the first country. It's not, you can't get it here in high income countries. So I think we're learning how to do this. Um, so I, I, I am optimistic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I want to ask a question to inflame Maz so he can ask a better question. You, you told us that all the correlates of immunity are antibodies and there's no correlates of immunity that are cell mediated. Um, but I think there are vaccines like Shingrix that probably work through cell mediated immunity. So can't we develop uh, correlates from the vaccine that requires cell mediated immunity to learn about standardized correlates? Um, I think we can. I think there, that and many scientists have been trying to move this forward, this idea of getting standardized approaches to cell mediated immunity, for example. Um, what you need is really the, the money to do all the standardization across multiple labs. Like if you think, think of something like the WHO Collaborative Centers for Infectious Diseases, they all use the same methods. They've tested the samples at different labs. They know everyone gets the same answer. That's the background work you have to do, but I don't know why it wouldn't be possible. Okay. So Maz is now going to tell us why cell mediated immunity doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> is that right? Okay. So on that, thank you very much, Joanne, for that great talk. Maz, are you going to take, take your job back? Yeah, about a week.
Well, um, it's with a great pleasure actually to introduce Dr. Nick Menzies, who's actually a brother of Dr. Dick Menzies, who's not here today. Now it's a joke, actually. There's no uh, relationship. Um, actually, Dr. Dick Menzi is an esteemed uh, associate professor of global health at Harvard, specializing in decision science and quantitative research. As a key member of Harvard's fac faculty, he focuses on the impact of policies aimed at combating infectious diseases, playing crucial role in designing effective disease control program, especially in resources constrained areas. With that, please uh, join me to welcome Dr. Menzi. Right. And I think something will happen and my slides will appear, so I'll just stand here, um, I think. Um, but so there is a relationship, though, with the other Dr. Menzies, as I like to think of him. Um, so when I became a researcher, you know, when I was getting established in the field, all the time I'd get some, you know, my work or his work would get mixed up. And so I'd speak to people and they're like, oh, yes, there's this other work by this Menzies, and it turned out to be my work. Um, I won't tell you what they were saying about it. I was, being, I was on a phone where someone was describing to me one of my own models as, again, this other work, this had been done. Um, and so I had planned to come here to accost this other Dr. Menzies, <laughs> tell him to stop riding my coattails. Um, but unfortunately, yes, I, I hear he is away. Um, oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I was holding his work. Um, but so, yes, yeah, so I will be the stand-in Dr. Menzies. Um, so for my talk, we're taking, taking quite a different direction. And so stepping back from the sort of hard details of sort of, the, um, sort of how the clinical trials work, and really talking about modeling of different flavors. So this is, um, you know, technically my team works in a lab, right? But it's a lab in name our own. We all just sort of work on computers, but we call it a lab because we're told to call it a lab. Really, this is sort of, um, sort of mathematical modeling and economic modeling, trying to say something about vaccines, but certainly quite different to some of the stuff you've heard already. So firstly, I'd like to uh, give thanks in different directions. Firstly, to the funders, so uh, the WHO Global TB program, as we mentioned already, and also the Gates Foundation. Also, a large number of collaborators on the research I'm going to show. Um, in particular, Rebecca Clark, who's based at LSHTM, who did a lot of the sort of epi modeling, epidemiological modeling I'm going to present. And Alison Portnoy, who is now at uh, Boston University, who did a lot of the economic modeling. And I was, I guess, in the room while that modeling was happening, so I get to present it. So to start with, what you can see here is a graph sort of made around 2015 showing three different visions for how TB might play out over the next kind of, what have we got, 20 years on this slide. So in the red line, you can see some would call it a pessimistic vision. Others, I guess pessimists, would call it a realistic uh, vision which is saying that what would happen to TB in the future would be kind of like what would happen to TB in the past, where we would see this sort of slow ongoing decline in global TB incidence year on year, which is good in that it's declining, but it would be just, sort of, again, 1% to 2% decline per year. If you follow the start of the solid blue line down to where it branches off and becomes this sort of dotted blue line, that's another vision. That's saying... What if we sort of turned up the volume on all the TB technologies and TB interventions we have today? So scaled up as much as we can, the current, you know, sort of testing approaches and uh, sort of treatment algorithms, um, so sort of greatly expanded preventive treatment, all based on current technology. This is what we would see. And we would see great health benefits, so much faster reductions in TB incidence, but they would start to flatten out after a while. After we had everything introduced, we'd be doing everything we can, um, but uh, so, the re so the rate at which incidence would decline would drop. If, however, you keep following the solid blue line all the way down, we see the aspirational vis uh, vision of the end TB strategy. The WHO end TB strategy 
aspects of which in 2015 sort of crystallized a lot of aspirations of how we might deal with TB, that not only would we scale up everything we've got right now, but there would also be investments in new product development. So new tests for TB, new uh, drug regimens, shorter drug regimens for both TB and latent TB, and as sort of, the, I guess, the, the jewel in the crown, the development of a TB vaccine, which would really allow us to prevent disease a lot more easier than we can, easily than we can today. We fast forward, I think it's around eight years, we get to the Stop TB Partnerships uh, global plan to end TB. And this really is a continuation of the same kind of policy drive. This sort of, this global plan is kind of putting structure onto the framework developed by the NTB strategy, trying to say, well, what are the interventions we need to do? Where do we need to send the money? What are the products we need to develop? And how much will it all cost? And again, in that plan, a, so a vaccine is central. So this is one quote, you know, a new vaccine is necessary to extend the benefits of prevention much more widely than we're currently doing. I guess another sort of point of reference to start off with uh, that um, I've always been already been beaten to the punch to is the announcement of um, earlier this week of the sort of starting off of the phase three trials for this M72 uh, vaccine candidate uh, starting in South Africa and about being rolled out in a lot of different high burden settings um, where there was a lot of doubt whether this candidate would actually make it to phase three trial, even though uh, so things look good based on the earlier trials, um, just given that the market incentives for vaccines are tough. The market incentives for vaccines in low income countries are even tougher. So I think it's um, a reflective of that. Um, that Wellcome Trust and Gates Foundations are the ones taking this forward. Um, but still, uh, as was made, as the point made earlier, this is a, a reason for optimism that we have one uh, candidate coming through and also, point made before, we'll need more candidates coming through um, given this of the uh, uncertainties involved in vaccine production. So with that context, clearly vaccine development requires huge resources. Again, not only do you need one good candidate, but you actually need multiple candidates coming through. And TB policy and planning over the last of 10 to 15 years has anticipated that we, you know, to achieve the success we want to achieve, we need a vaccine. And so if that's the case, we need to understand what we'll actually get out of a vaccine. If we do all this work, if we are successful, what will all this have development um, enterprise gain us? And when will we get the benefits? And where will those benefits be felt? And that's what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk and in what we focused on the study, which I'll really be describing. This was a study funded by the WHO to try and enumerate all the different kinds of benefits we could see if we successfully develop and deploy uh, a TB vaccine. And what we were doing is some operating, ooh, okay. Okay, you see the same thing I do. Okay. Well, uh, we're operating under a set of barcodes, essentially. Um, so uh, what we're operating under is this WHO full value of vaccine assessment framework, which was developed uh, not simply for TB, but rather out of the groups which were evaluating vaccines more generally at WHO, understanding that sort of traditional ways of evaluating new medical products don't work so well for uh, vaccines. And that if we simply focus on the benefits realized by individuals and the risks faced by those same individuals that get the product, if we're thinking about a vaccine, we're actually leaving out a lot of the different things that matter with a vaccine. Firstly, people who do not get the vaccine will hopefully get see some benefits from vaccine introduction. You know, this is the whole game with TB, that if we can reduce TB incidence and therefore in some way sort of interrupt transmission, we'll see more benefits than those just seen amongst those uh, sort of receiving the vaccine. Those benefits are not just health benefits, but they're also at the economic level. We could see reduced sort of need to spend on uh, treating um, TB. And so one of the posters we saw earlier today talked about how expensive it is to treat TB in Brazil um, and a lot of countries. I mean, I come from the US, it's hugely expensive to treat TB in the US. So if we have a good vaccine, we might sort of avert some of those treatment costs in the future. 
patients see huge costs associated with sort of both of being sick from TB and then going and receiving TB treatment, even in countries where that treatment is supposedly free. So we should see less households facing catastrophic costs of illness um, if we are able to successfully deploy a, a TB vaccine. And then if we bubble things up at the whole country level, we might see changes in macroeconomic growth potentially by introducing a vaccine. And so using this overall assessment framework, hopefully we can try and count up all of those different benefits. I'm kind of worried what we'll see on the next slide. Okay, that's better. Um, so that's great, so that's what we wanna do. We did this with mathematical modeling. Um, and so the point was very well made by the last speaker that you know observational trials come a distant second to RCTs when we're thinking about evidence. Well, you don't want to see where modeling comes on that list of evidence. It's sort of not on the page. And that, um, but still, uh, for the sort of long-term population level outcomes that we're interested in, it's very hard to conceive of the um, RCT or the very well-designed you know, observational trial that could give us that information. You know, ideally, if we could so take a facsimile of our world. We'll take, say, 100 facsimiles of our world, right? Photocopy it. And in each of those worlds, put in the sort of effort to develop and deploy a TB vaccine. And if we take another facsimile of the, you know, 100 facsimiles of the world and do the same thing, but don't, don't do the vaccine, do other stuff with that money. Then, you know, watch that for 30 years and see, compare those two scenarios. That's what we would like to do, but we can't. What we're doing with the model is trying to do a very kind of simple, you know, in some cases, simplistic way of trying to get at the same thing. We're trying to tease out what will happen in the future based on what we know right now about the mechanisms of disease. Um, and there's been some fantastic research done at this university, like trying to describe what, what are those mechanisms of disease. And what we have in terms of the potential, say, efficacy and duration of protection provided by a new product, and combine all of that information to sort of project out to the future, what might the consequences be? That's what we're doing with modeling, essentially, because we simply can't do the empirical research to provide this evidence, we're going to use modeling instead. So for this study, um, so I guess what we would normally do in this context is we would take a previously developed mathematical model, model, sort of tinker with it, make sure we adjust it to answer our questions of interest and move forward. Here we actually developed a new model uh, for this analysis and you can see a diagram of that model on the side of the slide. Um, and so almost with any sort of modeling presentation, you need a model diagram. So here's a model diagram, I'm not gonna explain it. But essentially what it's doing is allowing individuals to move between, or simulated individuals, to move between different model compartments, either reflecting changes in sort of TB epidemiology over time, or in changes related specifically to our intervention of interest. The reason we built a new model was for really, uh, sort of in addition to the sort of new technology development that's gone on with TB, there has been new realizations about how TB works. So as I mentioned, some natural history findings that we wanted to build in uh, to this model. Firstly is about self-clearance. If you went and found a sort of TB model from say 10 to 15 years ago, you would see a latent infection compartment, which after about five years after initial infection, people would find themselves in this latent infection compartment and be presumed to be at risk of developing TB at some low rate for the rest of their lives. Um, there's evidence coming out, uh, again, from McGill and other places showing that while there might be some risk in the future, there's an ongoing decline in risk over time, such that someone who was infected, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, is it actually you know, quite low risk compared to someone who might be, say, 8, 10, 12 years after they were initially infected. So we wanted to reflect that kind of stuff in the model. Also, the importance of asymptomatic TB disease, knowing that that may be a sort of a greater contributor to TB transmission uh, than we might have thought in the past. Um, and also to build this model and that it really can represent a number of different kinds of vaccine in the same model. So we built the 
epi model, and then knowing we had all of these different outcomes to try and estimate, um, we linked it to a number of different uh, economic models that would allow us to sort of not only say what the health benefits of a new vaccine might be, but also what the economic implications would be. For the vaccine itself, we looked at sort of two basic types of vaccine. One is a vaccine targeted to sort of adolescents and adults. You can think of this as an M72 type vaccine, right? This is the vaccine that is now just being going into phase three trials um, as of, you know, sort of Tuesday this week. Uh, so this is a vaccine that could be given both before and after infection and will prevent vaccinated individuals from progressing to TB disease with an efficacy of 50%. And in sensitivity analysis, we looked at either a 10-year or a lifelong, lifelong duration of protection. We also looked at a vaccine targeted at infants. I think this is a BCG Revax-like uh, vaccine, um, where this has to be given to individuals before they're infected, but again, would progr prevent progression to TB disease with 80% efficacy. And again, looking at 10-year or lifelong uh, protection. Here... You know, as we're interested in the population level rather than just at the individual level, we have to think about how this vaccine gets deployed, how it gets scaled up across and within countries. In the figure on the left, you can see sort of how we estimated that countries might adopt and introduce a vaccine once um, it has been sort of fully developed um, and is available. We base this sort of introduction timeline based on essentially historical experience in terms of how countries have adopted vaccines once they've become available, seeing that there are some countries that are just always going to be early adopters, um, but also, you know, countries with a higher disease burden, countries with sort of stronger immunization capacity are going to be those that are more likely to introduce earlier. And so we estimated, you know, that there will be some subset of studies that countries that would take up the vaccine very quickly after it was introduced, but there will be some countries that are introducing it, you know, 10, 15 years after it was uh, initially available. On the right, you can see what we assumed in terms of introduction and scale up within each country. So from the point at which they would introduce the vaccine, we're essentially saying there'd be five years over which coverage of each vaccine would be scaled up. For the infant vaccine, we assumed it would be scaled up within the uh, EPI program, so that's the routine immunization system. For adults, we're assuming that uh, there would be a routine program for adoles adolescents aged 14 years old, but there would also be a campaign, a catch-up campaign to vaccinate all adults above that age. So it's a one-time campaign, but hopefully you can see you know, in any given year, the cohort of either infants or the cohort of 14-year-olds is going to be a lot smaller than the, sort of the number, total number of adults. And so we'll see that play out both in the impact estimates, but also in the cost estimates. That campaign being, and the potential for a campaign being a major a feature of both of those results. So here's the health impact results. We have four, I uh, didn't mention before, but sort of a model calibrated to 105 different high TB burden, low and middle income countries. Here, summarizing the results at a WHO region level, um, broken up by whether they're one of the 30 WHO high TB burden countries or not, and then by WHO income group. Um, this is the reduction in incidence in 2050 under a you know, vaccine scale up scenario as compared to what we would have expected otherwise. If you remember back to that, you know, that sort of pessimistic dotted uh, red line we would have expected otherwise. And so we're saying across most, most regions, you could see with an adult vaccine in this case, around a 30% reduction in incidence as compared to what we would have seen otherwise. So that's, you know, that's a very real uh, health benefits. I think not quite to the level of what you saw in that very first slide I showed in terms of, um, you know, the extent of acceleration of TB incidence we want. But certainly, you know, this is large numbers of individuals not developing TB, large numbers of individuals not dying from TB. A number of things I want to point out about this figure. First is that as you look across these different sub-world regions, 
we're seeing fairly consistent effects um, in terms of the height of the bars. And for those regions where I guess the bars are lower, so you can see in the region of the Americas, is this gonna work? Yeah, so here, we see some of these lower impacts. That's really due to later introduction, where we were sort of simulating that these are gonna be the countries that were gonna introduce the vaccine later than others. So closer to 2050, so there just isn't the time to develop that impact. Um, if we look at, I guess, the comparison of the blue and the red bars, so the blue bar is our base case scenario. In the red bar, it's a slightly more optimistic scenario where we said once a country introduces the vaccine, it scales up quickly to you know, sort of the full coverage it's, it's going to uh, sort of obtain. We didn't assume there'd be complete coverage within each country, but there wouldn't be this phase-in period. Turns out that didn't seem to matter that much at all. What was much more important was when a country decided to introduce the vaccine rather than the pace at which they introduced it once um, they had decided to. The other thing to notice are, the, are these gray bars. So this is the impact that we simulated if a country introduced the adult vaccine, but only in a routine setting, that is without the campaign to reach or try and reach all adults, this sort of catch up campaign. This is just saying, okay, for the cohort of 14 year olds coming through every year, they will be vaccinated. Um, and we see sort of much lower impact under that assumption. That is to say, this campaign idea is critical to seeing large impacts, uh, large, you know, sort of relatively immediate impacts of a TB vaccine. So that's the health impact. But I said, again, we wanted to be able to talk about the economic impacts as well. And we actually tried to organize these in a number of different ways. And so, so we're going to walk through each of these. We'll start off with cost effectiveness analysis, because that's kind of the most conventional of the economic outcomes we see. Here, this is a table showing the cost per DALI averted. So a DALI is a disability adjusted life year. You can think of that as like the coin of the realm for these kinds of analyses. It's equivalent to, uh, well, it, it, the loss of a year of life uh, spent in perfect health, right? Dallies are bad. We want to avert dallies. And so this is the cost for each of those, you know, averaged across different world regions. If we're thinking about how to interpret these cost effectiveness ratios, as they're called. Think about this as like, a health system being in the supermarket for health gains. Goes to a supermarket, it wants to buy health gains as cheaply as it can, because the cheaper it buys the health gains, the more health gains it can buy. And that sounds simplistic, and certainly, you know, cost effectiveness is only one thing we should think about when thinking about what a health system should want to do. It wants to buy a lot of health gains, but it also wants to protect health equity and think about sustainability and do a lot of other things. But at least one of the things that's interested in is that kind of maximizing the health gain. And so in this context, and I'll just sort of looking at sort of the across all countries with a slightly misaligned box, um, we can see that for the adult adolescent vaccine, you know, we're seeing around $400 per daily averted for the infant vaccine around the same. And that's only when we think of the costs born to provide treatment, either the costs paid by the health system itself or the costs that patients pay to kind of either, you know, you know, so those costs together either to deploy the vaccine or, you know, to get treated for TB, right? There's cost savings in there as well, because if we avert TB disease, then we're going to avert the, avert the need to treat TB disease. In the second column, you see something called societal cost. Now, what that does is it includes all those same costs plus the sort of monetary value we place on um, people not dying from TB to the extent that they might be able to live on productive lives and contribute to the economy in that way. So these societal costs are including what we call in economics either productivity costs, sometimes people call them indirect costs, due to the fact that if people do not get TB, then they do not need to take the time and effort to go and get treated for TB. And also, if we avert a death, we get quite a long trajectory of additional life years where, again, people can contribute economically. 
So if we build in those sort of benefits of a vaccine, suddenly everything flips. And now we're saying that, you know, assessed between vaccine introduction in 2050, that these vaccines could actually be cost saving. That is to say, the economic benefits are actually positive. We're not spending money, we're saving money if we can consider that extra productivity. So those results were summarized at a world region level. Um, we can actually drill down to the so individual country level. So in this plot, every single point represents the results for an individual country. On the vertical, we have a measure of, sort of the incremental costs of vaccine uh, sort of introduction and the cost savings from TB care. On the horizontal, we see a measure of the health benefits. And we've put this plot together in a way where we can kind of draw a line through that plot, which you can see here, which represents one times per capita GDP. And that's useful in that, you know, in terms of evaluating health interventions, that's one crude rule of thumb as to when an intervention might be cost effective. If it has a cost per daily averted below that line, we might think, well, maybe in that context, context the intervention will be cost effective. If it has a cost per daily averted far above that line, we think, well, maybe in that context, there'll be other things that you should spend money on before you spend money on the TB vaccine. The color of these points is coded in terms of uh, TB incidence. And so the blue points are those countries which have high TB incidence, the more yellow shades are the lower incidence countries. And here we can see so the results turn out the way we think they should, where those countries which have a high TB incidence are gonna be those countries where we think it's more likely that the vaccine will be cost effective. Countries with lower TB incidence, it might be, but or there might be other interventions that should be funded first. These are the results for the infant vaccine. Uh, these are the results for the adult adolescent vaccine with that campaign I mentioned. Kind of similar results, um, but you know, bigger in two senses, bigger in terms of the, sort of the costs and bigger in terms of the health benefits. And again, all of that is really attaching to that campaign, reaching all adults. That's what's needed to get the big health benefits, but that also is a very costly enterprise. So now looking across countries and say, okay, well, which countries exactly would an intervention be cost effective in? This is looking at sort of classifying countries by where, at what level of per capita GDP we would see a vaccine to be cost effective. Uh, this is looking in two perspectives, so the health system perspective, right? So that's all the costs of the services themselves, the societal perspective, additionally including those productivity effects. In all of these different sort of scenarios, both for the infant vaccine and the adult vaccine, we're seeing most of the low and income, middle income population living in a country where a TB vaccine would be cost effective. Certainly it's not gonna be all of them. And so there'll be you know, 10 to 30% of countries where it will not be a good idea for that country to introduce a TB vaccine. There'd be something they should do first, but most of the low and income uh, country population is living in a setting where According to these results, it would be cost effective. So I'm gonna move on to budget impact. And this is important because cost effectiveness kind of answers the question of, of if we can add everything up across time, doesn't matter really when it occurs, we might discount things that happen in the distant future so, so that they matter less than things today, but it doesn't care so much about the timing of when, sort of when, when we need to spend money, but we do. We will certainly need to spend money on product development, and we will certainly need to spend some much more money on sort of scaling up a vaccine. In this figure, you can see our results for what we're saying the costs of the health services would be to scale up an adult vaccine. And this huge spike you can see in that kind of uh, blue line is the cost of vaccine introduction where almost all of that costs are those campaign costs that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and, and the, the scale of this graph is into the billions. There is a lot um, of money that will need to be spent scaling up um, a vaccine. And even if we have those money, I think, I think there was a point made about access to COVID vaccines before. Some of that's a supply question, some of that's a demand question. I think there's gonna be big questions on both sides of that argument for a TB vaccine. At the bottom of this figure, you can see some quite small lines, which are representing the cost savings we might see um, from introducing a TB vaccine. These are sort of the secondary effects. 
where we'll see savings because the health system won't need to pay for TB treatment. We'll see savings because patients won't need to um, pay for TB treatment. In this purple line here, you can sort of almost see a third order effect. So this is the cost of providing HIV treatment in countries with a high dual burden of TB and HIV, where we actually see additional costs there, some small additional costs. This is actually a good thing. This is saying that if we are able to introduce and scale up a TB vaccine, we'll improve survival of individuals with HIV in these countries. And because of that, we'll see sort of, you know, relatively small effects, but people on antiretroviral therapy living longer. So, you know, small additional cost, but there uh, as a reflection of sort of this additional good outcome. If in the same plot, we add in those patient productivity gains, this is what you see. So we've sort of shifted the whole curve up to add this additional line on. These are the quite large cost savings we project in terms of averted mortality and individuals going able to live on their, their lives and contribute economically as a consequence of that. Now, this is no longer the budget impact question because we can't take these productivity gains and use them to pay off the campaigns. We can't go to people who didn't develop TB and therefore didn't die from TB in like 20 years time and say, well, this is a good thing, right? So we need you to pay us to go back in time and fund these campaigns. So this, you know, this isn't something we think about in terms of the budgetary needs, but certainly it's useful to see, you know, alongside those budgetary gains, knowing that we are spending the budget to see these gains in the future. Next, moving on to return on investment. And so this is the idea of putting all these things together. So taking the health benefits and placing a monetary value on them and subtracting off the costs and thinking, what do we get left over after we've done all that? Essentially turning everything we've just seen into monetary terms. This is the kind of the formula one applies, the statistic one calculates is called the net monetary benefit. And so you see often some quite large numbers in terms of economic gains attached to global health interventions. And this is that number in terms of TB vaccines. So here we're saying for an infant vaccine, we might say, see sort of 68, so approximately 70 billion in terms of this net monetary benefit for introducing an infant vaccine, approximately uh, 400 billion for an adult adolescent vaccine. These estimates are going to be pretty sensitive to the value you place on a health gain. So if we value health more highly, um, we're going to see a higher net monetary benefit. If we place a relatively low value on health, lower net monetary benefit. But in all of the different assumptions we tested, all of these values are positive. All of these values are saying, even if we account for the costs, it's worth it. We're getting this sort of economic benefit um, from TB vaccines. All of the outcomes I've shown you so far are assessed at a population level. Indeed, I only showed you some country-specific results. They're almost at a, you know, sort of either health, you know, WHO region or global level. But we did want to try and think about how these benefits might accrue within countries across different population groups. Here in the graph on the left, uh, this is the result we estimated for how sort of the total number of TB cases averted would break up across income quintiles. So these are the income quintiles in each of the countries we simulated. We see the poorest quintile um, over here on the left is estimated to have more than double the TB cases averted than the richest quintile. Now this is nothing to do with assumed targeting by countries to make sure the vaccine is most available to, to lower income groups. We didn't make that kind of assumption. This is simply that the current burden of TB is so weighted towards uh, the so poorest income groups that anything that is going to deal with TB, as long as it is rolled out in an equitable uh, fashion, is going to benefit that group the most. On the slide on the right, <clears throat> we can see a similar kind of graph, but for a different outcome. So this is for the estimate of the number of households no longer incurring catastrophic costs due to TB. We're here, we're seeing sort of the poorest income group having three times the number of households, again, with these averted catastrophic costs um, compared to the richest um, quintile. 
sort of not only reflected that sort of gradient in terms of the burden of disease that I just mentioned, but also the fact that poorer households are much more sensitive to economic shocks like um, sort of a episode of TB than uh, richer households. Again, this is sort of within countries. If we look, sorry, if we look across countries, so this is now sort of treating, you know, essentially all of the countries we model as one economy that we're thinking about. And what is the poorest 20% of those countries? We see uh, perhaps expected, but an even more extreme finding in that the poorest 20% of the population across all of the countries we simulated is seeing 41% of the TB cases averted and over 50% of all the sort of averted instances of catastrophic costs. That is to say, if a TB vaccine is introduced, um, and again, if it's introduced in a way where the poor have at least equal access to the vaccine, then we're gonna see a majority of the health benefits accrue to those uh, populations. Okay. And that was sort of diving down deep, and now we're going to sort of back out the furthest we can. So I find that epidemiologists sometimes think about transmission dynamic modeling of the sort of type I'm showing here as kind of voodoo mathematics. You know, that you sort of find, you put some numbers into a computer and something strange comes out, and then we all have to interpret it in some way. Well, transmission dynamic modelers like myself think about macroeconomic modeling in the same way. So we brought on a, a sort of another group to help us do the macroeconomic modeling to understand what the sort of long-term population levels or economy level uh, economic implications of a TB vaccine might be. You know, noting that TB is a disease that certainly affects all age groups, but there is a particularly large burden of disease in those age groups that are sort of most economically productive. And so if there were a TB vaccine introduced and effective, we might see these economic benefits. And so what this graph is showing is for both of those vaccine candidates I talked about, you know, what the macroeconomic implications might be averaged over all the countries we looked at. It's interesting. You actually see these effects are fairly lagged over 2030 to 2040, perhaps even up to 2050, some of these effects are negative. That is to say, the resources that you put into scaling up a, a disease don't outweigh the economic benefits I just mentioned in terms of improved productivity. However, over the long run, we would see some increasing rates of economic growth. And to be clear, these are tiny changes in economic growth. Um, any single disease isn't going to have too much of a contribution to economic growth outside of certain specific examples, but still, you know, economies are big and these numbers do add up so that, again, these numbers are getting into the billions. Another sort of argument for the benefits of TB vaccines, but certainly very much delayed compared to when we actually need to spend the money to scale up these vaccines. Okay. So in summary, um, as I mentioned, you know, these vaccines could have huge health benefits, particularly in the poorest groups and the poorest countries. The largest benefits were estimated to come from an adult adolescent vaccine introduced with a campaign. Um, but at the same time, it would have high up. Tummy! Tummy! I promised it wasn't me. Okay. Um, maybe is, is that the you know the the message that times up or something? Anyway. Um, so so high health benefits, high costs. Um, you know major cost savings and productivity gains, but those are lagged uh, into the future. If we just think about the health services costs, it could likely be cost effective in a lot of countries. If we also think about those productivity gains, then it's likely cost saving. Um, as I said, those benefits concentrated in the high burden countries, which is exactly what we should expect, and uh, concentrated in the lower income quintiles within those countries. And for an exercise like this, 
it's a bit silly to point to only two uncertainties. Like there's a lot of uncertainties in all of this modeling, but still there are two things which really we were conditioning on in this effort. One is conditioning on the fact that we would get a vaccine. And again, this news of the new phase three trial is fantastic, but I think there is a lot of work to make sure we do develop a TB vaccine and we develop one soon. But also going to the point made earlier about acceptance and whether people will actually take a vaccine, I think those are very real questions. Um, if we develop a vaccine and it's taken up by 7% of the population, then we're not gonna see too much. And so there will need to be huge sort of efforts to work out how to deploy these vaccines in a way that they are sort of acceptable and taken by a large fraction of the population to see the benefits we're estimating. Okay. Thank you very much. Great job, uh, Nick. So I think there is, uh, the world has changed so much in the last few years. I mean, right now we're dealing with measles outbreaks in Montreal, okay? Mm -hmm. Stuff that I hadn't seen as a resident in India 30 years ago, I'm seeing now here in Montreal. So did you account for the growing global phenomenon of vaccine hesitancy, which is not only affecting childhood immunization, but clearly affecting adult immunization during COVID? And I think there are already some lessons from the malaria vaccine rollout in Africa, because that's a genuinely new vaccine being rolled out. And already the COVID vaccine hesitancy has spilled over to impact the malaria vaccine rollout. So we are operating in a very strange world right now. So I would not even think for a second the, the, the challenges we would need to overcome, even if by some miracle we had a good vaccine that's affordable. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And so, you know, in this exercise, we make assumptions about the scale, you know, the fractions of the target populations the vaccine will go to, and they're not 100%. But yet, you know, they are optimistic. They're saying, what if we can get it done kind of thing. And I think that is a huge question. I think, you know, so much effort needs to go into developing these vaccines. And I can't see a world in which we shouldn't do that. Um, but yet that doesn't mean that we'll be, you know, that we have achieved success once we've done so. Um, you know, we've got to realize, even if we only get to 10% coverage amongst the highest risk groups, that will be fantastic. But to do what is envisaged under some of the global plans and strategies um, uh, requires, I think, more optimism than one might take out of, say, the COVID experience. Like, I think it's dangerous to take too much out of COVID. I think it's uh, kind of unique in terms of like how people think about it and the saliency. Like TB has been killing people for many, many years and has not been in any way as salient, I think, as, in, as COVID in a lot of countries. Um, and so it is a, dif distinct, a different context, but yeah, I think you're right that what we have seen in terms of vaccine hesitancy with COVID, A, could spill over uh, to TB, but also tells us something about how people might react to something new, where it's not going to one of the age groups where we've seen it historically, right? So we looked at an infant vaccine. Okay, the world generally knows how to do infant vaccines. It's much harder to think about adolescent vaccines. There's HPV, um, but you know the experience in terms of how to get to high population coverage outside the infant age group is, you know, it's, it's newer. Yeah, great question. Nick, excellent talk. So I'm just to uh, echo what Maru was saying, because being from a developing country, most of the people who have TB infected, those people are not living in the city, for example. Mm -hmm. They live in the village. As an example, even during the COVID, when people was trying to convince some people, even they don't have access to vaccine, I'm talking about other vaccines, I received a call from parents asking, there's some people who come in the village, should we take the vaccine, yes or no? So which is a problem? And you have this asymptomatic people. Mm. When you, what you describe looks like you have a prophylaxis and therapeutic vaccine, which is actually up to 50% efficacy for people who are already infected. Mm. Not sure if they're going to give only one shot or they're going to need a boost which yeah. is another problem. 
coming to the field and the second and third time saying, I'm going to give you another boost, which is, they're going to cash in again. So there is a lot of things to think about it. And absolutely, if you can have one vaccine combined with a good treatment that fixes the problem, that will be the best. Treat and vaccine. Yeah, no, I, I think you're completely right. There are challenges, and I think um, uh, others will know much better than me, but I think we, say for M72, it would be heading towards a, you know, there'd be more than one dose needed. Um, and certainly all the challenges you say and more. I think that some of this, you know, is, is so we're now getting to the point where we need to work that out. I think, you know, say five years ago, uh, we didn't need to think too much about implication, I mean, implementation because we weren't near enough to actually having a candidate that might work. Now we're getting to the point where a lot of the sort of just working out how we might feasibly introduce a vaccine and sort of deal with some of the issues you describe, I think now is the time. And on top of that, because I was uh, in October, mm -hmm. the first week of October, Bill Gates was in Senegal launching this uh, Grand Challenge Africa. Mm. So President of Senegal was there. And I think what is also important is to have a vac vaccine-based manufacturing base mm. in mm. those developing countries. They're building one in Rwanda, one in South Africa. There is one in Senegal as such. I think also with communication, going to the people, to the village, not really be at the city like most of the people do when they mm -hmm. go to the field. They don't go to the field. Mm -hmm. I think this is something, the bridge, we have to break the glasses and really go where the needs are. It's yeah. a problem. No, certainly. I mean, I think one thing, so we haven't got to this challenge yet, but so say if we are successful with M72, the next thing we're going to hit is supply. And my understanding is that the, just the, I think this is the point made before that we need multiple candidates um, coming through successfully because some will not be successful. We need multiple candidates because some will be better for different populations. But simply the supply of any single candidate will be, if, if we're successful, if, you know, M72, if it was like 65% successful, we'd be fantastic. We will not have enough of it. Like the expectations are for five, 10 years. And so um, having factories fed, spread throughout the world and developing multiple different candidates so that there's multiple vaccines will be important. Hi, Nick. Sorry if I asked a stupid question. Maybe it was in the, all the analyses you presented. If you assume an efficacy of 50%, you can work out the cost effectiveness. Can you drive the model backwards and determine what's the minimal efficacy that is cost savings? And then we can determine if a 32% efficacy is still useful rather than throwing in the trash. Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, the easy answer is yes, certainly. Uh, either you could just take the result, like you could either take the results of the model and simply back calculate it. Often these models, you know, they get fairly complicated, yet in the end, the results are fairly smooth in the parameters. And so you can either run the model lots of times for different efficacy values and find that threshold, but you'd actually get fairly close just doing it on a napkin. Um, I don't think that, you know, so you could do that. I think the question would be is, is that the right answer? And so when we think about some of these questions about um, sort of acceptability, would people and would health programs be interested in a 32% efficacious vaccine? Would having such a vaccine sort of inhibit the development of new vaccines? I think those questions get quite complicated. Certainly a country doesn't want to have so lots of vaccines going on at the same time. Um, companies developing vaccines don't want to try and have a sort of vaccine um, uh, to go through the regulations in a particular country until they know that it's going to be a good thing. And so you could do that, but I just know there will be um, other considerations, which mean that a low, effic low efficacy, but still efficacious vaccine might... Um, face greater headwinds than might be suggested in that kind of analysis. Thank you. Another question? Yes, 
Thanks, Nick. And this kind of goes on to maybe a bit of what Marcel was asking. You'd, you'd looked at um, efficacy of 50% and 80% and duration, uh, protection of 10 years and lifetime, and then different scale-up strategies. Mm -hmm. I, perhaps I missed it, but which, which one of those, I guess, is the most important? Should we be focusing on a vaccine that's lifetime versus 10 years? Or should, like, is duration of protection more important than uptake versus efficacy? Were you able to tease this out? That's a hard one. Um, so we looked at a number of different scenarios. Actually, in addition to the ones you looked there, we looked at some price scenarios um, and different ways of modeling the vaccine. And yet we still didn't look at all kind of combinations you might be interested in. Um, one thing you can see here, hopefully from these results, is some of the delays involved. And so those features which tend towards giving immediate impact I think if we can target a vaccine to the age groups with the highest TB incidence, we'll have, you know, that's a favorable attribute of having benefits you can see. Uh, a vaccine that is going to have lower efficacy, but that's going to sort of continue paying off over the lifetime is good, but um, is harder for health funders where they're not going to kind of, is it actually going to change the curve of TB incidence? Um, where, and you can see that actually in our infant vaccine results, where, right, vaccinating infants, very young infants are at very high risk, risk of, you know, rapidly progressing TB. But on the whole, you know, children are pretty low risk for TB. And so if you so if vaccinate infants, there can be a delay, even if it's a long duration of protection, there can be a delay until you really see the epidemiological benefits. Um, and we saw that sort of sort of coming up in some of our results where the adult targeted vaccine, just given it's targeting an age group, which is have, has a higher incidence rate, um, had the more immediate benefits. Uh, but just going back to your question, what matters? I think certainly the product um, specifics matter, but I think any product that successfully gets through all the trials is likely going to be good. The big questions are the ones that people have raised of, can we have enough people willing to take this vaccine? And can we develop enough vaccine to give them? Um, that'll be the things that matter. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay, thank you. All right, it's a, it's a proud moment for me to introduce uh, my, my former postdoctoral fellow who's now my immunology teacher. And, and more recently, he's actually asking me to take out the trash and, and order x-rays for him and everything. So he's really grown up. Um, from a very high level view, I have a concept which could be totally wrong, but that in TB we need certain tools and some tools we need where we've got tests and drugs we have engineering challenges to make better tests and better drugs. And when we don't have something at all like a vaccine, we have a concept challenge and not an engineering challenge. And when you have a concept challenge, you need crazy people thinking up crazy ideas, sometimes at three in the morning in the New Delhi restaurant. Um, and Maz is that man. And uh, so ever since his postdoctoral fellowship here and then in Harvard with Heinz Remmel, he's come back and he's just taken us by storm with unusual thinking, orthogonal experiments, and also taking uh, TB research and a flu research portfolio at the same time so he can contrast the immunology that may be protective to one and, ha and hazardous to the other and try to understand what are the common themes and the different themes in immunology that could guide us forward. So uh, we look forward to hearing his latest crazy ideas and where they may take us next. Thank you, Maz. Thank you very much, Marcel, for this kind introduction. So I don't know if the crazy man is standing up here and, and uh, uh, so for the next, I would say now, I think we have one hour to two hours. Uh, I hope you could, I could convince you that um, maybe we should change our, un, you know, conventional approach in uh, TB vaccine. I think Joanne mentioned some of the major problem that we have, including like, we don't still know what is the correlates of protection while we just keep generating vaccine and testing them. And uh, so, so there are major, major 
caveat in this whole approach. Um, and then also, you know, providing some evidence that maybe we do have a, a, a unconventional approach and, uh, and then kind of a, a novel approach to hopefully tackle uh, a, a vaccine for TB, which I think is ultimately, as I mentioned, is, uh, could end uh, tuberculosis. Um, so I think, you know, we all know infectious diseases are leading cause of death throughout the history of humans. I borrowed this uh, uh, graph from one of the Casanova paper. Uh, we could see that, you know, in 19th century in Liverpool in England, uh, more than 50% of the people wouldn't even reach to the age of uh, 20. Now, if you look at the in 21st century in UK, you know, more than 50% uh, of the people reach the age, uh, more than 50% of people reach the age of over 85. So this massive, uh, uh, basically, increase in human life expectancy are due to the three major controls that we have for infectious diseases. One was the hygiene, preventing the transmission of infection in mid 19th century. Vaccine preventing disease in infected individual late 19th century, and of course, antibiotic preventing death in patients with clinical disease in early 20th century. So, we could easily see the impact of these three major phenomena in TB. So, if you look at uh, this, is a statistic from uh, US after the discovery of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the cause of TB by Robert Koch, discovery of X ray for diagnostic antibiotic, and ultimately BCG vaccine, we brought TB in North America almost to uh, a zero. However, when we look at this statistic globally, that's not the case. As we discussed, we could see that, you know, still more than 1.5 to 1.8 million people, they die of tuberculosis every year, and they haven't been able to really uh, eliminate this, uh, uh, this disease. So, what is the reasoning for that? I mean, what is the reasoning that you have a disease that is going on, even, you know, the footprint of the TB was discovered in the mummies so for such a long time, and we haven't been able to defeat this disease. I think the major reasoning is that, uh, you know, not me, but a lot of people that sitting here, including Marcel, Urban Share, and many other people, is our fundamental lack of understanding of immunity to TB is a major gap for developing novel therapy or vaccine against TB. So basically, we don't understand the pathogenesis of disease very well. And if you don't understand the pathogenesis of the disease, it's hard to find a vaccine. So host defense against infection usually has two major components. We, we very well known about the host resistance, basically, how our immune system is trying to eliminate a pathogen. But at the same time that we generate inflammation, we generate immune response to any given pathogen, then we also increase tissue damage. And this tissue damage needs to be actually controlled. And if, if, if we don't control this tissue damage, or we call it disease tolerance, that could really cause, uh, is a major cause actually of the morbidity and mortality. And disease tolerance basically limit tissue damage and reduce negative impact of any infection uh, on host fitness without really directly affecting the bacteria or the pathogen burden. So the vast majority of people actually succumb to death in pulmonary infection, especially viral infection, even, you know, like SARS-CoV-2 and flu, it's not because they have the massive viral load in their lungs, indeed because they die of this massive immunopathology. And you have a vital organ such as lung that cannot basically function, impede gas exchange, and ultimately people will not survive. And that's really not because you have a, a lot of uh, pathogen load in the, in the, in the lung. So, so we need to consider at the same time that we generate immune response to get rid of a pathogen, we also need to make sure that this inflammatory res response is really controlled. Um, so if we want to put this concept in, the, in MTB, I would say that you know, there are major two, er, two phases in tuberculosis. One phase is the early phase of the infection, and the other phase is a chronic phase of infection. During the early phase of infection, of course, we know MTB infects human through the airways and often through the you know, uh, airways. 
and will reach to the lower airway and they will infect uh, a residential macrophages called alveolar macrophages in the alveolar space. And they hang out here. We don't know for how long in human actually, but ultimately, I guess these frustrated macrophages will take the pathogen from the airway into the intercession tissue of the lung, and that's the place that we start forming granuloma. And granuloma is basically is a mixed bag of both innate and adaptive immune cells. And what we do here is we're trying to uh, uh, prevent the dissemination of the disease. So if we want to put this immune response to TB in the context of host resistance and disease tolerance, this early phase is really working out with host resistance. And this late phase or chronic phase is really dependent on disease tolerance. And this is how much we could tolerate uh, the, the pathogen and the disease. And if we want to compartmentalize these two different phases, the early phase of infection and you know the host resistance really depends on innate immunity. And that chronic phase or disease tolerance, it depends mainly on adaptive immunity, although we do have a, a innate immune cells in, in the uh, in the granuloma as well too. And that, com that combination provide the host defense against MTB. So we think if we wanna get rid of this pathogen, we really need to look at this early phase. This is the window of opportunity that we have, that the pathogen still in the airways, haven't reached to the uh, intercession tissue, haven't create this complex immune response, and we potentially could get rid of the pathogen at this earlier stage. And if you want to do that, it's really heavily dependent on your innate compart. So the natural immunity to any infection starts with the pathogen invasion that brings the innate immunity in, into action that also provides uh, and instructs adaptive immunity that leads to the induction of adaptive immune response, in particular converting the naive T cells into the effector T cells and often after this uh, initiation of innate and adaptive immunity, we usually get rid of the pathogen and, and we basically uh, eliminate the pathogen and then we generate memory response. And this memory response is a factor memory T cells or actually B cells as well too. And, uh, and in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, for instance, we were very lucky because this natural immunity actually works. So people get infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they could be protective against subsequent SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then we use that concept like many other vaccine that we have used by using different vaccine platform, either using uh, adenoviruses or messenger RNA based vaccine. We overexpress one dominant antigen of the pathogen and that leads to the induction of uh, 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 adaptive immune responses, generation of effector memory and B cells, and ultimately neutralizing antibody. As Joanne mentioned, that uh, you know almost 99% of the all vaccine that works in human is uh, dependent of this neutralizing antibody. And this system, if it works, we could possibly use it, and 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 that could help us to generate a vaccine. But if you look at the natural immunity in TB, it's neither able to completely eliminate the bacteria nor to generate protective memory response to prevent the subsequent infection. So this whole system appears to be not really working in tuberculosis. So because, you know, as Joanne also mentioned, we know that antibodies and B cells seems to be not able to generate uh, a protection against uh, MTB in terms of the vaccination. Virtually all vaccine that we have now in pipeline is based on the T cell mediated immunity. And this is because since discovery of the T cells by uh, Jack Miller and Max Cooper, and then Bob North took this, uh, and Bob North shows in 1973 actually that the uh, thymus drive lymphocyte contribute to the containment of TB independent of antibodies. And then the beginning of the HIV infection, reduction of T cells, increase of uh, disease, a TB disease in this patient, and also the memory capacity of the T cell, they all indicate that T cells are the right candidate for generating a vaccine against tuberculosis. 
But we know that actually T cells can promote the pathogenesis of TB. This is an example from one of the study that we have done several years ago. We manipulate mitochondria of the T cells in the way that we were able to generate more antigen specific T cells against TB, either CD4 positive T cells or CD8 positive T cells. And when we, when we look at these knockout mice, we, we could easily see that, you know, we really boost these antigen specific T cell responses, which is ultimately what we wanted for protection against MTB. So we were very happy with this observation. We said, fantastic, we have these incredible T cell responses, so we should see an amazing protection now against uh, TB. But when you look at the CFU in the mice, in uh, infected mice, we were not able to see any differences in, in terms of the control of the bacterial growth in the lung of the infected animals. And indeed, what we observe is that the knockout mice that generate more T cells than the control group, they succumb to death earlier than a, a control group. This clearly indicates that despite the similar, similar level of bacterial growth in the lung and increased level of antigen-specific T cells, these mice were not able to survive. And when you look at the lung of these mice, the knockout mice, we could see that these T cells, you know, really destroy the lung. You could see a massive immunopathology. It's obvious even in the gross anatomy, looking at the growth uh, of this lung, and uh, there's tons of nodule, and, and, and of course, these mice were not able to survive with this type of immunopathology. But when you look at the human also, there's a beautiful paper published several years ago by Joel Aaron and uh, Sebastian Ganyu that in fact, human T cell epitope of MTB evolutionary hyperconserved. So, you know, any other pathogen, if you look at the influenza virus, or if you look at any other pathogens, they have a high mutation rate. And as soon as your immune system develops an antigen specific uh, T cells or B cell response, they will try to subvert that by creating a mutation in that particular antigen. But it seems like TB actually doesn't care. The mutation rate of TB is very low, and they don't mind actually this, they're generating all these antigen specific T cells. And indeed, this paper suggests that these antigen specific T cells could help uh, the pathogenesis of the TB, and indeed, they might be required for transmission of TB in humans. Then we have this uh, beautiful story from uh, Daniel Barber uh, from NIH showing that you know if you use TB1 blockade, they increase there is a that you increase the chain, you increase the rate of the tuberculosis in people. So if you inhibit, and you actually you promote antigens, uh, promote T cell responses that could you know reveal tuberculosis in these uh, cancer patients. And finally, if you look at all the preclinical and clinical uh, trial that has been done with TB using antigens, you know, targeting T cell mediated immunity, so far none of them have been very successful. These are a couple examples. This is an using a, a vaccinia for antigen 85A, which is a dominant antigen for CD4 positive T cells. There is, this is a, a, another, uh, in, uh, another um, <clears throat> trial using H4IC31, it's a protein-based vaccine. And indeed, in this study, the BCG group, which was a, a, the BCG control, which is a BCG revaccination, provide a better protection against uh, a TB than, than act, actual vaccine. And I didn't put the M72, which is created a lot of hype, but this is, I think, is still very early. And we know that the M72 vaccine only works in the people that have been actually exposed to tuberculosis. It hasn't been working in the naive individual that have not been exposed. And also the numbers that calculated to show that increase, um, the reduction in the incidence of TB is still, uh, the, the, is very low. The total number, N number for that study was 39, okay. So there's lots of uh, caveat in that study. I hope it works, but even if it works, we need still more vaccine as both previous speaker, Nick and Joanne mentioned in their talk. So, if adaptive immunity is not the answer for developing an effective vaccine, can we harness the power of innate immunity in TB vaccine uh, in, in, for, for vaccine development against TB? 
So the first question is that, does innate immunity have memory-like capacity? So if you look at all the species on Earth, more than 98% of all species on Earth rely only on innate immune system. They don't have adaptive immune response, okay? And it, so it becomes really imperative. It, it becomes imperative to consider that a critical evolutionary trait like immunological memory must be evolved in the innate arm of the immune system. And that's actually true. So if you look at the uh, as basically a simple organism, like uh, this is a, a plant that heavily rely on the only innate immune response, they, they have this systemic acquire resistance that provide a long distance signaling against the uh, uh, secondary infection. If you look at invertebrate, in this case, it's a copepod, and you infect them with the tapeworm, and then you go back and reinfect them with the tapeworm again, the one that initially was infected with the tapeworm were able to provide a better protection against the secondary infection compared to the uh, control group. All of these indicate that actually these simple organisms, they have innate immune response, and this innate immune response has memory response. And, and most recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, there are many studies indicating that you could also see that in the immune compartment of the more complex organisms, such as humans. And, and indeed, a lot of this innate memory response in, imprinted in, you know, uh, in monocyte macrophages or other immune, innate immune cells are heavily dependent on epigenetic reprogramming. So, we were interested in monocyte and macrophages, and tell you why. So this is Dr. Baer, and I don't know if you have seen his chest. He has this beautiful tattoo, TB, on his chest, okay? But I want to tell you why macrophages is very important for maintain maintenance of this TB tattoo, because these macrophages are required for persistence of tattoo in Dr. Bear chest. And I want to really emphasize on these macrophages now a little bit more. So as I mentioned, you know, we really like to get rid of the TB. We should think about this early phase of infection. And that early phase is rely on uh, innate compartment, mainly uh, pulmonary macrophages. It turned out that these pulmonary macrophages, they're coming in uh, different flavors. So you have these alveolar macrophages that initially drive from yolk sac and fetal liver, and they become a residential macrophages in the airway. And then up in the infection, you have this bone marrow drive that coming from the bone marrow into the circulation, and ultimately into the lung to fight the infection. So I have a master's student, uh, Laura, who was very interested to understand that what is the contribution of alveolar macrophages versus bone marrow drive macrophages in immunity in TB. And she beautifully showed in this study that these al alveolar macrophages, because of their metabolism, their ba basically their, their immunity to MTB is compromised. And, and uh, there are other studies, including this study from David Russell, also found out in Jake Smith, uh, a similar observation. And, and this observation with regard to the uh, macrophages was not only limited to the mouse, because we also saw similar uh, uh, phenomenon in human alveolar macrophages versus monocyte-derived macrophages. And the reasoning is that these alveolar macrophages are heavily rely on the unique metabolism, which is mitochondria dependent, we call it OXFO, while the monocyte drive macrophages are able to use glycolytic pathway, which are able to quickly become inflammatory and inhibit the growth of the bacteria. So I think evolutionary makes sense that, you know, we have a better understanding why MTB getting into the lower airway and infect these alveolar macrophages, and they could replicate within these alveolar macrophages because uh, their metabolism basically provide the ability for MTB to grow within the, within these cells. So the question that we had was, how can we harness the power of these recruited macrophages in immunity against TB? Initially, we thought that what if you just reprogram these macrophages, fully differentiated macrophages? But then we were when we were thinking 
a bit more carefully, we thought that, well, if we do anything with these fully differentiated macrophages, ultimately they will die and their reprogramming or their whatever they need to do also die with them. So we decided to look at the progenitors of these macrophages that are sitting in the bone marrow. And these are basically stem cells that generating both, you know, basically all the immune cells or blood cells, including monocyte and macrophages. So as a proof, as a proof of concept, we initially started this study with the BCG because as we all know, BCG is safe. It's been given to children as soon as they're born is effective to prevent a disseminated form of the disease in children, but uh, the, the, it, it seems like it's, uh, the protection efficacy in adults is going from zero to 80%. And the most prominent T cell antigen of MTB, including ESAT6 and CFP10 are missing in BCG. And there's no direct link between BCG specific T cells and protection against TB. So as a proof of concept, uh, uh, Eva Kaufman, basically show in this really cool story that if you just change the route of BCG vaccination from interdermal subcutaneous to IV, now you're providing BCG to get access to, your, to the bone marrow. Is BCG able to reprogram your HSCs or hematopoietic stem cells epigenetically? And now you could generate monocyte macrophages that are able to go into the lung and provide a better protection against MTB infection. Following this study, uh, Mihai Natia beautifully show that a similar phenomenon could be true in human. So after in human that vaccinated with the BCG, this is intradermally, these uh, people are BCG vaccination could reprogram hematopoietic stem cells and now if you take monocyte drive macrophages from the BCG vaccinated uh, people, then basically these monocyte macrophages are able to provide a better protection against MTB infection. And this protection was not only limited to MTB because you could find similar protection against other infection as well too, such as uh, influenza and, um, and, and also uh, fungus. And all of this, again, was dependent on epigenetic reprogramming of hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow that transmitted all the way to monocyte macrophages. After this study, we actually went back to the history of BCG vaccination in non-human primates. And we could see that actually people in 70 have shown that if you change the route of BCG vaccination, and, and use BCG IV in non-human primates, now you're providing a better protection against TB. And there's this beautiful study came out recently in Nature from Bob Cedar Group showing that actually BCG IV vaccination could prevent TB in non-human primates. And I think this is really a big, this is very important because now we are not talking about preventing the disease, actually, we were talking about preventing the disease right at the earliest stage of the infection. So clearly, um, all of this indicate that just changing the route of BCG vaccination could significantly alter the immune response and provide a better protection against MTB. So one of the other study that I think is, is we, I, I mentioned, we know BCG vaccine provide protection in children, but not adults. And we still don't know why again. So why, what is the reasoning that, you know, BCG provide protection in children, but not in adults? So Nargis Khan uh, decided to go after this question. So what Nargis did, she decided to basically do exactly what is happening in human. But instead of human, you start vaccinating mouse. So as soon as they born by four days vaccinated subcutaneously, and then you have adult mice that he vaccinated also uh, at the same time with the same dose of the BCG. We waited six weeks and then challenged them through the airway uh, uh, with MTB. And then after five weeks, we look at the bacterial load. So we could easily see that the protection that you observe in the neonate vaccinated mice was almost too long compared to the protection that you do see with the BCG uh, vaccination in adults. 
And indeed, if you do the same experiment and extend from six weeks to 20 weeks and challenge them again with the MTB, we could see that while the protection of the BCG is gone in adult, this protection still exists in the neonate vaccinated mice. And indeed, the dissemination of MTB from lung to other organ, including spleen, was significantly uh, reduced in neonate BCG vaccinated compared to adult. So following this, we thought, what is the reasoning for this protection that we see in the neonate BCG vaccination? As usual, we go after conventional T cells, CD4, CD8 T cells. We can't find any differences. They have similar frequency and numbers of CD4, CD8 T cells. So the conventional T cells were not the answer for this protection in neonate mice. Then we look at unconventional cell, uh, unconventional T cells. One of them is gamma delta T cells. And we could see after BCG vaccination in neonate, there is an increased number, frequency and number of uh, um, of the unconventional T cells, the gamma delta T cells in the blood and in the lung of the vaccinated animals. So it seems like these gamma delta T cells, which are unconventional T cells, are responsible for this protection. To prove this, we actually vaccinated neonate gamma delta T cell deficient mice. And following vaccination, we could see that the protection is gone. So all of these data indicate that BCG vaccination in neonate works mainly via gamma delta T cells that could provide the protection, long-term protection against MTB. And then there was this beautiful study came from Nigel Group in Australia showing that in human children vaccinated with the BCG, also there is no differences in conventional CD4 CD say, but there is an increase in gamma delta T cells as well as NK cells, both um, that they're producing more interferon gamma as well, too. Okay. So one of the things about this gamma delta T cells is that this beautiful work that came from Ruslan Metzotov group in science recently, and what they show is that these gamma delta T cells are regulating the intestinal response to nutrient sensing. And this is essential for providing protection against the uh, pathogens. And I'm wondering that this beautiful study that came recently in Lancet showing that the, the nutritional support profoundly reduced TB incidence in household contacts could be also dependent and rely on these gamma delta T cells. And, and I think this type of this study is going to help us to understand what are the correlate of protection and how we could use them for generating a vaccine against tuberculosis. So for designing TB vaccine, in summary, for designing TB vaccine, we don't know about the correlate of protection against TB. That's exactly what Joanne mentioned in, in her talk. But there are ways that we could have a better understanding of this correlate of protection. There are three different ways I think we could address that. One way is that you know, 90 to 95% of the people, they tolerate the disease. So what is the compartment and the component of immune response, this natural immunity that provides this protection in this uh, population? And we could, if we could identify them, then we could find probably uh, uh, use them for designing a vaccine. The other one I think is really cool and something that uh, Dr. Erwin Scher working on is that this resistor group, that actually these, these are the people, household contact, they are TSD negative, and basically they are protective against, uh, um, against TB. So we think that probably one of the component that essential for this protection in these people is most likely is the innate compartment. And why the innate compartment in these people become so good in dealing with the MTB, we still don't know. And I think Dr. Rensher, soon we will have some clue with that regard. The other possibility is the BCG vaccination in children. You know, why BCG vaccine provide, uh, prevent Miller uh, tuberculosis in children? Is that rely on these unconventional T cells? And all of these probably going to help us to have a 
better understanding of correlates of protection uh, with uh, uh, with uh, co correlated protection for developing a vaccine against a TB. And beside that, you know, as um, Kim mentioned in in her poster, we know that VCG also provides cross protection against other pulmonary uh, infection. And in this paper that Tim Burufi show is that, you know, if you vaccinate BCG, if, if you vaccinate mice with the BCG intravenously systemically, you could generate these effector memory T cells that are able to cross talk with the innate compartment in the lung, in particular alveolar macrophages, and through interferon gamma, they, these macrophages are become super good to fight against other infectious diseases. So can we learn from that and implicate that into the uh, TB vaccine. The other thing is that what we don't know about the pathogenesis of TB, you know, we always think that TB is a pulmonary infection. It's true, but we know also TB disseminate to many organs. You know, you could find them in the draining lymph node, you could find them in the, in the spleen, find them in the liver, brain, and we could also find them in the bone marrow. And there is a severe consequences if TB get access into the bone marrow. Because what it does in this paper, we show that it could really prevent a, a protect generation of protective innate immunity against uh, infection. So if MTB get access into the bone marrow, it could reprogram your hematopoietic stem cells in the way that now we generate monocyte macrophages that are going into the lung and they become more permissive against MTB. So, you know, there is some serious consequences here, and we haven't really addressed these uh, concerns. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge, I think I acknowledge people that did the work through this whole complex uh, presentation that I presented today, uh, the funding agencies, all the collaborator that, you know, has been absolutely uh, instrumental for, for doing these studies. Uh, thank you very much. Sarah. Hi, Maz. Sorry. Great talk. I, I know we... Oh. Now. Just a moment. Oh, Sarah, do you have a question for Maz? I do. Thank you so much, Marcel. Um, hi, Maz. So quick question for you yeah. regarding the, like the vaccination of the neonate pups. Yes. So when you waited six weeks... How do you know that protection that you're seeing isn't caused by just the BCG being present somewhere rather than the actual protection induced? So when you're seeing the six versus 20, did you check to see if for the six weeks the all of the BCG was cleared from the system? No, the BCG is still is in the system. Both, uh, you know, I think that probably the number of the BCG reduced by 20, the, the next experiment when we look at it after 20 weeks but the BCG is still is in the system. I'm not sure we have done experiment using antibiotic to clear the infection and then look at the uh, uh, subsequent infection with the TB, but that's a very good point. Thanks. Erwin, you're about to ask a question. I see it on your face. I was not about to ask a question, but since you won the question, then I oh might God. as well ask Please something. <laughs> <laughs> so how do pro-inflammatory, macro, meaning macrophages that you define as being driven by glycolysis, how do they kill MTB with which mechanism that are not present in the Oxfos macrophages? And, you know, it also came back to my memory, and you know, of course, the, the opposite observation by Tom Horn who claims in his resistor monocytes that the resistance is driven by oxfos, but he also doesn't say what kills MTB. Yeah. I think we don't know the exact mechanism of what kills MTB. One of the mechanisms that we think is most likely is the case is a cell death program. To my knowledge, that's the program that is able to really get rid of the uh, MTB in macrophages, and how, you know, how the the glycolytic pathway is linked to cell death program, not necessarily inducing actually necrosis, but ap apoptosis, uh, is still unknown. That's something that we are trying to figure out, uh, everyone. 
really interested very much, as you know, yeah. you know what exactly kills MTB. Yeah. You know? No, I agree with you. We are very interested too. But, but it's just that's, that's, that's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> a meeting of the minds. Good. <laughs> I think the two of you should get together and have a drink one time <laughs> and talk about murder and see what the other people in the bar think. Madhu, next. Um, this is less, this is not a uh, scientific comment, Maz. I just wanted to give a shout out for the ridiculously talented young people you've mentored in the past. And I know many of them and you mentor now, how productive and beautiful their work has been. That's just a, a comment. Okay. Thank you very beautiful much. Beautiful job. Uh, secondly, India is about to revaccinate. Yes. With BCG. And I get so many media people calling me about that and I send them to you and, and Marcel because it's political <laughs> and I have That's a hardest not what time. The thank you is for, <laughs> by the way. And it's political and I'm not sure. And Nick, you need to track that too because it's like a real life example of if you start offering BCG, I don't even know what proportion of Indians will accept it and all sorts of interesting data is going to come out of it. But just from what you've read and, and seen so far, you think it has any hope of working in a high burden country like India that's already been BCG vaccinated at in infancy for decades? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the reasoning that we think that the BCG vaccination basically wean off when you become adult is that the BCG probably is gone by that time frame. And the study that uh, I show you the, in New England Journal, Journal of Medicine that revaccination in, in South Africa actually did work and provide some indication or some measurement of protection, although that, that's much also not agree, maybe it's very small. So, you know, I, I guess we don't know what would be the outcome. So is it gonna work? Maybe it's gonna work, but I could tell you that the revaccination of BCG could provide protection against other infectious diseases. That's for sure. I could tell you that it could happen. You know. <laughs> yes. So uh, just the the part that I understand about revaccination of BCG to prevent new infections was a secondary analysis of a mm -hmm. randomized trial. It wasn't the primary analysis. Right. So that has now been redone, and the primary analysis will be. Uh, uh, reported next week at the Keystone meeting. So I'm waiting to find mm -hmm. out, I think Monday night or Tuesday night, and maybe by Wednesday it'll be on, on Twitter. Omar. Wonderful, as usual. So um, I'm just dreaming that this can be happen and fix the problem that people are having with tuberculosis for so long. Um, the route you use is always fascinating, the IV. So if you want to translate it, I know this is really more fundamental trying to answer the questions. How are you going to do it in the field in a translational you know, way to make it? Are you going to find something like uh, equivalent in the lab because you can't just keep uh, yeah. using the... No, I, I think I think you, you're right on, uh, Omar. I'm not sure that anybody in this room wants to have 10 to the 6 CFU injection of um, a BCG in their bloodstream. So uh, most likely this would not happen, although I know, you know, Bob Cedar group at the NIH trying to test that in humans. Oh, yeah. um, but there are actually group in England that they're testing, uh, they're aerosolizing BCG into the lung. And that seems also provide more mm. uh, protection. Um, in terms of how we could translate that to human, I think that the goal for us is to figure out these protective pathways. Mm -hmm. And these protective pathways, you know, maybe are multiple pathways. And then we, we are trying to find out what part of a BCG actually generate this yeah. protection. Is it MDP? Yeah. Is it, you know, TLR dependent, and then use that approach mm -hmm. in order to reprogram some of those uh, yep. hematopoietic stem cells in order to, you know, for, for, for vaccination. So that's that's the idea Excellent. that we are. We thank are you. Great. So, so Maz, thank you for that presentation. And now you are the MC again. 
and you will take us to the finish line. And I think that is the award ceremony. So take us away. Yes. So um, so I guess we're going to start with the publication award in 2023 calendar year. Am I correct? Fantastic. Good. So actually, I've been said that I got to make sure that, you know, this there was a committee was a strike for this award. And uh, there were three members, uh, three basically judges looking at this publication and scored them. And scored them based on the research approach, originality of ideas or methods, and impact of the research. So there was three major criteria. So, um, so I'm going to start, basically, there are three awards. I'm going to start with the first award, which is uh, the winner of the Emily Eskemeni Award for Best Papers in Biomedical Research is uh, Kim Tran. And the paper is BCG immunization induces CX3CR1 high effector memory T cells to provide cross protection via interferon gamma mediated train immunity. Congratulations. So, okay. So for the Jonathan Meekins Award for best paper in clinical health outcomes research, the winner is Anita Svadezin. Svadezin, okay. Um, and the title of the paper is Do Private Providers initiate anti TB therapy on the basis of the chest radiographs, a, standard, a standardized patient study in urban India. Congratulations. And lastly, for the Margaret Becklack uh, Award for the best paper in clinical health outcomes research, the winner is Camila Romanowski. The title of her paper is Healthcare Utilization After Respiratory Tuberculosis, a Control Interrupted Time Series Analysis. Congratulations. So, um, I know, but okay, so um, I, I don't have. Who won? Who? I right on spot. Okay. Okay. What do we start with the third? Okay. Yeah. Please. Okay. So uh, I guess we had uh, we had eight posters. And uh, the posters uh, was judged based on the content and clarity, visual app appeal, research innovation and significance, poster presenter speech, two minutes, and question answer session, three minutes. So thank you to all. Thank you to all for participation. <laughs> and wonderful job. You guys did a wonderful job. And thank you for all the judges that take the time. Okay. Okay. So what if we just start with the third place? And the third place goes to Harsmeren Sidhu. Uh, is, is he here? Okay. Congratulations. Fantastic. Great job. Uh, the second one goes to Ilyas Jabbar. Okay. I think I think he left. And the uh, first place goes to Mina Sadergi. So congratulations to all the winners. And um, I guess thank you very much. It was very fascinating meeting and uh, and I personally learned a lot and uh, and uh, you know 
it was it was great. And thank you to Dr. Burr for interjection and uh, making it more fun as usual. Thank you all, and all the very best. Thank you.